Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a statement by Paul Peelhouse on new psychoactive substances in Scotland. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be therefore no interventions or interruptions. I call on Paul Peelhouse. Ten minutes, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer, uh, for the opportunity to make a statement today on the matter of new psychoactive substances, substances whose sale is not uh, restricted, but mimic, which mimic, if taken by an individual, the effects of controlled drugs and can be just as harmful and can, in some cases, have fatal consequences. I'd like to bring the Chamber up to date with the latest developments and what the Scottish Government is doing in response. The challenges are there for um, my announcements today are not only from a, an enforcement perspective, but also in respect of our education efforts. These challenges have been well rehearsed in this chamber and I have been struck by and I'm grateful for the consensual nature of the debates on this issue and the goodwill and well-informed uh, contributions from members across the chamber. Members will no doubt agree with me that the biggest difficulty and perhaps frustration uh, is that the existing legislative framework enables these substances to remain legal where not knowingly sold for human consumption and thereby not come under the traditional radar of the Misuse of Drugs Act, on which we have relied to control drugs. To this end, I am pleased to announce that the expert review group established by my predecessor has presented its report to me, and this has been published today. It makes a number of key recommendations on how the existing legal framework might be strengthened, not just in the available law, but how the existing legal framework can be made to work better in practice. I am pleased to advise the Chamber that on behalf of the Scottish Government I am minded to accept the recommendations of this report and I wish to record my thanks to all those who directly contributed to this work and those who offered the group insights and expertise from the field. You will appreciate that I have only received the report today but wanted to place this in the public domain to alert you to its findings. You have my commitment that these recommendations will be taken forward with vigour, uh, with priority and in a spirit of collaboration and consensus where this can be found. One of the clear barriers to progress is identifying a shared understanding of the problem. In particular, there is a need for uh, a clear and practical definition of NPS, more evidence of the harms being caused in the immediate, medium and long term, and better data collection and sharing across the range of public services. I heard uh, this directly yesterday from our NPS evidence group, a parallel group of experts that has been brought together by the Scottish Government uh, to review the available evidence on NPS. I am pleased to further announce that this group will be working to develop a definition of NPS that can be used consistently across different sectors. This will assist the courts, uh, forensic experts and those supporting people using NPS. The group will also be reviewing existing systems of data collection and information sharing uh, to improve our knowledge on the extent of NPS use and the associated harms. The particular recording difficulties in respect of accident and emergency departments has been raised in this chamber before. Uh, in addition to the work of the evidence group, I am delighted to uh, announce that the Scottish Government will shortly be commissioning specific research to enable us to better understand the prevalence and harms of NPS use within specific vulnerable subgroups of the population. Stakeholders across Scotland have raised concerns about the use of these substances among vulnerable young, young people, adults with mental health issues and injecting uh, drug users as well. Evidence about the use and harms of NPS within these groups is very limited and there are concerns that the consequences of NPS use among these groups may be particularly severe. Uh, the position is exacerbated by the alarming number of new NPS products appearing on the market each and every year. I recently visited Forfar Police Station in Angus and heard firsthand about the proactive approach taken by local police, trading standard officers, uh, Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service, community campaigners and others on the proactive multi-agency approach that has been taken in Tayside to tackle NPS. Operation Carinate, as it's known, targeted individuals and premises that sell NPS. This has seen officers utilising common law and trading standards regulations at premises selling NPS. This action has resulted in the closure of premises selling NPS and is an example of good practice of a number of agencies and communities working in partnership to tackle uh, the issue of uh, new psychoactive substances. The partners in Angus indicated this has reduced NPS purchases in their area, but it is early days. Only last month I had the opportunity to close a member's business debate on motion submitted by Alex Johnston uh, on new psych psychoactive substances needs assessment for Tayside and in preparation for that debate and my subsequent visit I was struck by the excellent work being done to tackle the issue these substances are causing uh, to local communities. I have also become very aware of the significant degree of consensus across the political spectrum in the chamber on this challenge and the recognition that there are no easy answers to the questions posed by NPS. As I take forward the range of matters discussed in, my report, uh, in the report, sorry, I am extending an invitation to my colleagues in this chamber from across the parties to join me in a ministerial cross-party group on NPS. 
I will write regarding the details of this to colleagues in the near future. However, in essence, this group will continue to examine the work is under, that is underway uh, to build a shared understanding of the problem, hear from experts in the field and oversee the work as it unfolds. Our education efforts must also continue. Our drugs campaign, Know the Score, continues to offer reliable and non-judgmental advice on drugs and their risks, including new psychoactive substances via our free helpline and website. We also support Cho Choices for Life, delivered in partnership with Police Scotland, uh, a drugs, alcohol and tobacco education programme for school children across Scotland, supported by an information website. Choices for Life will shortly be releasing a video of the dangers of NPS via the GLOW uh, online learning portal uh, to, for schools. And I've also seen firsthand the work of Crew, which is another excellent partnership we have in place. I personally learned a great deal uh, on my uh, visit to, to Crew about the harmful effects of NPS uh, during that visit, and as do uh, the individuals they engage with on a daily basis, including family members of those who are using NPS. I would like to examine the, with the Ministerial Cross Party Group how we might better connect with young people uh, and exploit social media in this regard to educate young people on the risks they face if they do use NPS. I would also like parliamentary colleagues to work with me to examine how we might work with the Scottish Youth Parliament uh, to raise the profile of NPS and to support them to complement the efforts of this chamber. A specific recommendation of the expert review raised the need for a first-class forensic capability that can develop clear standards to support fast and accurate information on NPS for those not just in enforcement but also in critical areas of the health service like accident emergency departments. I'm already in discussion with Forensic Services, Scottish Police Authority on how we uh, can take this forward and this is particularly important given there is evidence from Wales of substances increasing in strength. Again, I would hope that the Ministry of Cross-Party Group can oversee the development of a national centre of excellence. There is a specific recommendation for new legislation to be introduced and I recognise and acknowledge the potential role of the UK Government in securing new arrangements to bring NPS under legal control. The Home Office have been helpful and cooperative in the work of the expert group and I will be meeting my counterpart Lynn Featherston MP to press on her uh, supporting us to bring these substances under legal control in Scotland. In summary, Presiding Officer, the report of the expert group has been published today and I have made a number of immediate announcements on commissioning research on the prevalence and harm that is caused by NPS and beginning work on a definition to guide those in the field as part of an immediate response. I have also invited parliamentary colleagues to join me in considering the work in more detail, including overseeing the increased effort in educating young people and developing a first-class forensic service to strengthen our response. I am encouraged that the expert review concluded that there were a range of existing powers that can be used to tackle the sale and supply of NPS and that these can be made more effective. The practical work to progress these operational matters will now begin. And I'm also clear in my commitment to ensure new legislation is brought forward as quickly as possible to put these substances where they belong, subject to criminal proceedings. As has been echoed in this chamber many times, the term legal high has been regarded as a misleading and unhelpful term. I hope that the chamber will support the findings of the report I published today, making the question of the legality of these substances very clear, identifying the harms they cause and putting where appropriate those who seek to sell them in the knowledge of the harms they cause behind bars rather than behind the shop counters in our high streets. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. If you wish to ask a question of the Minister, it would be extremely helpful if you would press your request speak button now. And I call Elaine Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Minister for the advanced copy of his statement and for making it available an hour uh, in advance of the statement to the Chamber. Scottish Labour will be pleased to take part in the cross-party working group that he proposes. New psychoactive substances are an issue which governments around the world are struggling to cope with. Biochemical knowledge is now so advanced that if one substance is banned, another with similar effects on the receptors in the brain can be synthesised to replace it. With regards to the forensics, has the Minister examined the approach taken in Wales, where last year the Health Minister allocated funding to the Wadinos project, which provides a mechanism for the collection and testing of unknown and new psychoactive substances or combinations of substances, and issues advice on harm reduction? Has he given consideration to, made, to the suggestion made by my colleague Kezia Dugdale in a debate just over a year ago, which seemed to have some uh, acceptance by his predecessor, that the universities could work with organisations such as Crew 2000 to set up a social enterprise which would enable drugs which are taken off the streets to be handed over uh, for assessment? 
Uh, and can he also clarify what he means by pressing Lynn Featherstone to support you on bringing these substances under legal control in Scotland? Are you arguing for the devolution of these powers, in which case I put it to you uh, that there should be no borders in the fight to control the harm caused by NPS? Minister. Um, well, I thank Elaine Murray, sir, firstly, for her very um, positive contribution in terms of the debates we've had up to now and also her warm words at the beginning about wanting to work with the government in the ministerial cross-party group, and I certainly welcome that myself. Um, on the new substances emerging, uh, she's absolutely correct that uh, we have, I think in the last year, 81 new substances have come on the market, and that shows just how difficult it is for the authorities and uh, those working in the third sector to keep on top of what the impacts are, the harms that there are on individuals, and to advise those individuals the risks that they face in taking them. So that's why testing and the forensics uh, capability is so important, being able to understand when a new product emerges, just what is in it, how potent it is, and potentially to, to rattle that information through the cascade, through uh, the community that are serving uh, drug users to make sure they are prepared for and aware of the risks that they face. Uh, so we are looking closely at what is, is being done in Wales and Weddinos. Um, I can't promise we'll do exactly the same. We obviously have to uh, look at that and that's something we can take forward in the, in the, cro the cross-party group. But um, we certainly are aware of that and officials from my own department are engaging with our colleagues in Wales about their, their, their progress and being kept informed of that. Uh, the, the point regarding the universities and the social enterprise, I will happily look at that. It predates me, so I will, I will take account of, of what uh, Kezia Dugdale said previously. Um, but that's again something we can take forward in the ministerial cross-party group. Um, and as to pressing Lynn Featherstone, we are aware, clearly, we want to work collaboratively with the Home Office and the UK Government on this. I, I respect the point that that has been made by Dr Murray about cross-border issues. Clearly, we face challenges. Um, my colleague, Cabinet Secretary, is meeting uh, in a trilateral with the Irish Government tomorrow, and we'll be discussing these issues with them. So um, clearly it doesn't respect boundaries. We need to work together and we are learning a lot from what the Irish have done themselves and clearly the Home Office has produced its own report last October with 31 recommendations of its own. So we are studying these uh, reports and working closely with our colleagues and I would just encourage Lynn Featherston to help us insofar as uh, the UK Government can to, to affect the result we all want to see. Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thanks too to the Minister for advance sight of this statement. Uh, the Minister made reference um, to my colleague Annabelle Goldie's question yesterday to the Solicitor General uh, about how many people supplying these substances have been convicted under common law with reckless and culpable conduct. The response was these figures are not available. Clearly this is a matter of concern, especially as the report identifies that using a charge of reckless and culpable conduct has been successful in securing convictions. So uh, I'm very pleased the Minister um, addressed this data collection issue in his statement. I too confirm that um, the Scottish uh, Conservatives will be happy to take part in the cross-party group. However, there seems to be a, a number of different expert groups looking at this issue without an overarching coordinator. So I wondered if the, the Minister could um, perhaps confirm if this is an aspect that has been considered. Minister. I might, you might, the member might expect me to say this, but I hope the Scottish Government is providing some overarching uh, coordination of this activity. But I take the point that, that it does appear to be different strands, but I can assure uh, Margaret Mitchell they are coordinated and they are complementary rather than cutting across each other. So the, the work that I, I witnessed yesterday at the expert group uh, looking at data issues uh, was, was sitting alongside the, the work that's being done of the expert legal group looking at the legal aspects of it and obviously a focus on data and statistics and information sharing in, in the second group that I met yesterday. So um, they are uh, complementary rather than uh, cutting across each other. I certainly welcome Margaret Mitchell's uh, confirmation that the Scottish Conservatives are, are, are happy to take part in this group and I very much welcome that because I know uh, members such as Margaret Mitchell and Annabel Goldie have a lot of interest in drug use issues. So that's very positive. And in terms of the, um, the issue that was raised, I know the uh, Solicitor General is looking at how we can improve the availability of Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service data to ensure we do have as much visibility as possible. So that's something that has been taken forward following the question session yesterday. Thank you. We need to finish by three o'clock because I do need to protect the debate that comes afterwards. I have 11 members who wish to ask a question. If you keep to a question and the Minister keeps to a brief answer, we'll get through. 
Graham Day, followed by Alice McInnes. Uh, thank you. The review group report states that there are a number of benefits to the approach taken by the Irish Republic to tackle NPS, citing as an example uh, the, uh, the reduction in the number of head shops from 102 there in 2010 when the legislation was introduced to just 10. But would the, the Minister accept that shutting down such premises, welcome though that would be, isn't in itself going to solve the problem of NPS, not least of all because the addictions they've helped create will presumably be fed via the internet instead? Minister. That, that is an important point. Uh, the Irish uh, have managed to ban all sites using Irish domain names as, a, as another part of their approach. And uh, if we do go forward with proposals to perhaps, uh, as recommended in the report in paragraph 6-9, on the, the merit in considering a new offence to deal with the sale or supply of NPS, that would also potentially ban the sale via the internet. But it clearly, again, because internet sales are, are regulated if in effect by the UK government in this context. We need to work closely with the Home Office on such matters and, uh, and other uh, departments at UK government level. So it's another example where coordinated approach between Scottish government and UK government may be uh, helpful in this regard and working with our colleagues elsewhere in the European Union to make sure that the internet sales issue is addressed. Alice McInnes, followed by Nigel Dawn. Thank you, President Officer. The Minister noted the need for first-class forensic capability. Forensic services is overspent by 0.29 million and is facing a further 0.214 million unallocated cost reductions before the end of the year. And this SPA has admitted this is beginning to put pressure on its finite resources. Excuse me. Given the importance of tackling the menace of NPS, can the Minister advise what additional funds will be available to for forensic services to build that first-class um, capability? Minister. Well, clearly, I, I recognise that, um, like all parts of the public services, we are under uh, pressure at the moment uh, due to uh, funding constraints. But we will work closely with um, Police Scotland and indeed the Forensic Services to identify what is possible within existing resources and, and where necessary, if there are additional resource requirements, we will take those on board. But um, it's, it's early days. The, the report has just been produced. Uh, we are signalling that we accept the, the point that's been made by the expert legal group and look forward to working out the detail. And that's clearly something we can discuss within the group that I've suggested today. Nigel John, followed by Jenny Mara. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful to the, member, uh, to the Minister, of course, for his statement. And I recognise that he's doing lots of things about the physical supply within, within the country. If I could just extend Graham Day's point, I'm wondering what the Minister feels he can do, presumably with the Home Office, to deal with what's going to happen, which is an internet sale and supply. And that will only be worked out, of course, through international uh, discussion. Minister. Um, well, it's, um, it's early days, but I appreciate that uh, European Justice Council, the, the issue of NPS use has been discussed in the past. I know it is on potentially an agenda item that's coming up in the near future. Uh, that may be a forum whereby we can engage with other governments to discuss um, a, a coordinated approach across the European Union to tackling the problem of internet sales. Um, there are some challenges in terms of internet sales for those who wish to use that route. Uh, I heard in Angus that there's predominantly young unemployed males that are using NPS and therefore they may not have access to credit cards or other means to actually use internet sales, but clearly there's also a risk that somebody could do so and then sell on to those individuals uh, separately. So clearly the, we need to have a, a sophisticated approach to this. There is no single silver bullet, and that's why it's useful, I think, to, to take on board the, the ideas of all other uh, parties in the, in the chamber and work together to try and come up with a coordinated solution. Jenny Mara, followed by Kevin Stewart. The Minister will know how important this is to the communities I represent in Dundee and Angus, where there have been fatalities as a result of legal highs. Scottish Labour called this week for the collection of data, uh, the amount of people pre presenting themselves to A&E having take taken legal highs. Now, the Minister said today that he would be reviewing existing systems of data collection, but he did not give a com specific commitment to collection. Can he please tell me what timeline he aspires to for the collection of this data? Uh, well, I certainly rec recognise the issue that data collection and, and looking at new means of collecting data is obviously something that uh, we are interested in. The group yesterday that I met uh, in Edinburgh were, uh, were looking at that very issue. What we could use existing data, but obviously what other forms of data we could deploy, whether there are um, existing uh, information systems that could be, if adapted, could adapt in such a way as they could capture more useful information on uh, the granularity of, of drug misuse and therefore within that NPS use. So I can give the member an assurance that is something we are looking at. Uh, clearly, um, it's, it's important to, to take an evidence-based approach to policy development at any point in time. And uh, we do lack, uh, at the moment, the, a comprehensive picture. And there are some differences of opinion emerging that, that perhaps the statutory sector see a different message emerging in terms of use of inter, uh, intravenous drug use uh, deployment. 
and in the uh, third sector, people seeing uh, an increasingly um, a new group of people using intravenous um, drug misuse. So uh, we have um, some conflicts in data and we need to bring them together and understand and get a comprehensive picture so we know where the problems are, the prevalence rates and indeed the particular drugs that are being used. Okay, Mr. Stewart, followed by Dr. Richard Simpson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The uh, Local Government Committee is currently looking at the Air Weapons and Licensing Bill, and there's a, a sense of frustration amongst folk in Aberdeen that there's a lack of licensing provision uh, for shops specialising in the sale of psychoactive substances uh, and drug paraphernalia. Is there a practical way that we can bring these kind of shops into the licensing regime to give folks peace of mind? Minister. Well, certainly the um, expert legal group did look at alternative models in places like New Zealand where licensing has been taken. Uh, while there are some strengths to that approach, there are also concerns uh, about it as well. And it wasn't deemed to be, uh, in the words of the expert legal group, the, the, the most appropriate solution in this case. But I recognise the point that Kevin Stewart makes about the concern among communities about the prevalence of head shops in, in their high streets. And that's why it was so positive, the action that was taken in Angus to tackle this issue uh, through trading standards, through Police Scotland and the local council working to together to identify how they could use common law and careless and reckless behaviour to, to identify where uh, there was irresponsible sale of NPS, uh, putting at risk uh, young people and, and others in the community. So successful action has been taken in that community, uh, led by uh, community groups uh, forcing the issue home and, and, and putting their own pressure on those suppliers, and it has had the benefit of shutting down those shops. Dr Richard Simpson, followed by Alex Johnson. Uh, Minister, there is considerable avoidance of prosecution by labelling products as not being for human use and at the same time not saying what effects could occur if it was used by a human. Can I ask him if he would hold early discussions with the New Foods Scotland uh, Agency to look at those products which, whilst labelled for animal use, are clearly being sold with the intention of human use to see if we can't get warnings to be extended uh, so that at least people are being protected? Minister. Um, that's um, that's a, a useful point that, that, that uh, Dr Simpson has made. Certainly, I agree with him. There is great concern that products, the, the whole perception of these products as being legal highs is entirely misplaced. They are legal if they are not being used for human consumption. They are clearly very dangerous in many cases if they are used for human consumption. And we know some of the substances which mimic existing illicit drugs may be eight uh, or more times as powerful as the, uh, the, the equivalent product. So people will be taking maybe a similar quantity and then completely taken by the, the strength of the the dose they take and that may cause fatal consequences. So we all have an interest to make sure that labelling is clear to make sure people do not consume them uh, at all and uh, certainly take forward the point that Dr Simpson uh, suggests and, and we'll discuss that within the ministerial cross-party group. Alex Johnson followed by Mark MacDonald. I thank the Minister for taking broad action across a broad front after being in receipt of this report. Uh, can I also suggest that the, we commend the action that was taken by Police Scotland in Angus, where the common law and trading standards were used in combination in order to facilitate a, a raid on such a shop. Uh, I wonder if the Minister could tell me if any other uh, sections of the police force across Scotland have taken similar action and whether this is likely to become policy both Police Scotland in future. Minister. Well, I think um, I am aware that in South Ayrshire uh, a appro similar approach was taken some years before, but um, I think it would be fair to say that Angus has, uh, has, has, has demonstrated a, a much more you know, coordinated and wide-scale approach to tackling the problem at a community level, and there has obviously been a strong community uh, impetus behind that as well. So perhaps it is more recent and it is more um, uh, uh, in, in the light of emerging trends, if you like, in higher incidence of NPS use and the higher availability of products. So in the case of Angus, it is certainly very much welcome what, they, what has been done there is certainly something we are very interested in. But in order to be able to use careless and reckless in terms of the common law, uh, we need to be able to demonstrate harms. And so that's why it's so important to have the forensic capability and the, the, the coordination with our health professionals to understand the, the physical, emotional, psychological impacts of these substances on individuals uh, and to be able to demonstrate harms. It makes it much more easy to enforce once we've got a clear idea of the harms of each product. Mark MacDonald, followed by Rhoda Grant. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to the Minister for his statement and also for the 
the focus that is being placed on education uh, within the action the government is taking forward. However, can I ask, beyond the education targeted at children and young people, if he will examine the expansion of that to include the adult population, given the important role that parents and community leaders will play in terms of ensuring that the strong messages that the government wishes to convey are put across, but also in terms of spot, being able to spot the signs of NPS use in young people who they are responsible for, either as parents or perhaps as youth leaders. Minister, I think those are extremely important points that, that Mark McDonnell makes. The, um, uh, the work that Crew do in Edinburgh uh, is a good example. They are a national organisation, they are nationally commissioned, and they can provide support across the country. But Crew work with uh, parents, so often parents will come in for confidential advice about the substances they know their children may or may not be taking, and, and be able to get advice. So they are aware of the risks themselves, and be able to obviously support their children, hopefully coming off. Uh, these substances, but uh, also equally important for adult users, we are seeing increasing incidence of um, experienced drug users perhaps diverting into using NPS. They are sometimes cheaper than the, the equivalent and uh, more freely available. And therefore, there is a danger um, that they are getting back into a culture of people using intravenous um, methods of, of deploying uh, drugs and therefore putting themselves at risk of bloodborne diseases, uh, uh, ulcers, and even amputation risks. Uh, so there are, there are serious consequences associated with uh, injecting drugs uh, intravenously and therefore uh, we need to make sure that people are equipped with the knowledge to keep them safe. Uh, if they are going to use these substances, we need to do the absolute maximum we can to prevent them putting themselves at risk. Rhoda Grant, followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask what assistance can be given to local authorities with regard to licensing premises that sell NPS and whether lessons can be learned from the approach taken by the local authority down in Lincoln to stop these outlets opening on our high streets? So, certainly on the latter point, we are um, going to take an interest in what's happening in Lincoln. Um, it's a measure that uh, isn't directly comparable in Scotland, but we are going to study what, what the implications are of that. It will deal with activity that's out in the Public, public space, but wouldn't necessarily prevent sale of, of the substances as we understand it. So it will only have a limited impact. But in terms of licensing, I recognise the important role of local authorities, obviously um, in terms of uh, discharging their functions in planning, licensing, and the role of trading standards are clearly important and uh, players in this. And they've worked very constructively in Angus Council and South Ayrshire Council to uh, help tackle the problem at a local level. We want to make sure all local authorities are aware of what's possible, what the toolkits are available to them. And that's one of the key uh, recommendations in the report, developing a toolkit for trading standards officers to know what the powers they have are and how they can deploy them most effectively, learning from good examples in Angus and South Ayrshire. So the more we can do on that to help local authorities to tackle problems at a local level, the better. But I certainly welcome Rhoda Grant's comments and, and are keen to, to help ensure that happens. Roderick Campbell and finally John Finn. Um, how would the Minister evaluate the success of the Know the Score uh, helpline and website to date? Minister. Um, certainly, the, the, the website has been uh, effective in, in that it has reached uh, a large number of individuals. Know the Score um, provides, obviously, a, a good source of information which is, um, it can be read at time and at leisure of the individual. It doesn't uh, deal with any issues to do with anonymity. They can read it in their own time, in their own space, and, and learn about the, the challenges. But we have um, had some evidence of um, using uh, Facebook, for example, to promote the use of Know the Score. And I know that the campaign that was launched last year managed to uh, generate uh, 11,000 clicks or 5,000 additional people visiting the website over, over a single month that the adverts ran. So we can do more to make sure people are aware of where the information is, uh, where they can access it. And I know agencies like Crew and the, and the local ADPs make sure that local residents are aware of Know the Score and it is a valuable resource for them. But it's only one part of the picture and using information on the internet through GLOW to, to educate children is also a very important part of, of what we propose to do. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. Minister, the misuse of drugs legislation represents 45 years of failure in many people's eyes, myself included. Uh, we must engage in terms that people are understand. In the meantime, that is the term legal highs. I commend the work of crew as you do. Would you agree with me to use education as the primary vehicle for addressing the concerns that we all have? Minister. I do think that is um, that is probably true. Uh, we, we have a situation where we have to deal with immediate impacts on individuals, but in the longer term, because of the number of these products that are coming to the market, we need to get people 
educated, young people particularly, educate that the risks they face. We know many people attending clubs are being presented with NPS as a, as a, as a uh, so-called soft option or legal, legal high and maybe not aware of that they are, that doesn't apply in any way, shape or form, that they are properly regulated, that they are safe. Um, the misleading aspect of them being properly professionally packaged also leads people into thinking that they are perhaps safer than they are. In, in truth, when people take them, they can't be guaranteed they'll get the same experience with one packet they will get with another. And we have found that they have sometimes been cross-cut with illicit drugs as well. So they may be taking something which is extremely powerful and may do them uh, enormous damage. So we have to educate people as to the risks, um, uh, make sure that they are, are not going into uh, a situation where they may be using uh, an NPS product uh, without uh, a good grounding in knowledge as to what the risks they face and perhaps to deter them from doing so. Thank you. That ends uh, the ministerial statement. Can I thank the minister and members? Uh, we can do it when we try to keep it brief. Uh, we've managed to get through all of it. We now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12423 in the name of Marco Berge in, on the Commission on Local Tax Reform. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request to speak button now. And I call Marco Berger to speak to move the motion, Minister, 13 minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And from the outset, I want to say that in looking at tax in the Scottish Government, we base our approach on four principles, efficiency, convenience, certainty, and of being proportionate to the taxpayer's ability to pay. These principles aren't new, neither to this government nor in general. They are attributable to Adam Smith in Book 5 of The Wealth of Nations. The present council taxes compliance with the first three of these maxims might be debated, but most would recognise that the council tax, as set out in the 1992 Act, and which has been with us now for over 20 years, does not, in a substantive sense, adhere to the fourth of these maxims of being proportionate to the taxpayer's ability to pay. That's not just our view, it's the view of many around and outside this chamber who have all proposed or suggested reforms over the years to try to address this shortcoming. Yes. Well, way, just a couple of weeks ago in this very chamber, John Swinney, defending the council tax, said, and I quote directly, council tax liability is linked to ability to pay through the council tax reduction scheme. And it is linked. What my statement was, if you go back to what I said, it was in a substantive sense said here. There is a linkage, yes. Could it be greater? Yes, it could. And let's, let's look at that Act. The 1992 Act hardwires in a lack of progressivity. Band H properties, yes, they do have a, a liability greater than that of Band D, but their value is four times and the liability is twice. So clearly there is a limit to how close that link is. And as those values are based on the situation in 1991, it takes in no account of subsequent changes in relative price. So areas that haven't benefited from house price increases haven't seen their council tax bills become lower than those that have had a bit of a boom. The valuation bans in council tax also means no differentiation between properties in the same band. And as with the late unlamented stab duty, there's a bit of a slabbing effect that penalises those properties whose values bring them just into the higher band and no more, giving them the same charge as one that is near the top of that band. And even looking at the banding should raise concern. 74%, almost three quarters, are in A, B, C or D, and only one in 200 are in band. And, H. and all of this is based on the assumption, one subject to many debates in this place over many years, that the best way of assessing an individual's ability to pay is looking at the value of their home. Now, since 2008, we've been addressing the worst failings of this flawed system by delivering funding to local government that has enabled all councils to freeze council tax. With the continuing agreement of all councils in Scotland, that freeze is about to run for the eighth consecutive year. The cumulative savings over the period 2008-9 to 2014-15 for Band D households amount to over £900. We estimate this will rise to around £1,200 by 2015-16. Before the introduction of the freeze, the average council tax per dwelling increased by over 50% between 1997-98 and 2007-2008. This wasn't just far beyond inflation, it was financially crippling for certain types of households like pensioners 
who were dependent on a modest fixed income but still earned a little bit too much to qualify for council tax benefit. And for many, there was a real fear in awaiting the annual council tax letter dropping through the letterbox and onto the doormat. Today, this at least is no longer the case. And in addition, with our local government partners, we stepped in when the UK government abolished council tax benefit to ensure that vital reliefs could continue. The council tax reduction scheme, which Gavin Brown kindly introduced to the debate, affords people a targeted relief from council tax liability. At its peak, it applied to over 550 thousand people in Scotland. It corresponds to £360 million of support in that year and 22% of all households. And we have to contrast that with the approach taken in England, where localisation of council tax relief has meant over 300 different schemes being operated, some of which mean the UK government's budget cuts are falling on those least able to pay, even more so than council tax unamended. Alex Johns. Will the Minister concede that the suggestion that council tax relief was abolished in Scotland is not entirely accurate and that what happened was that a significant proportion of that funding was devolved to Scotland and much of the scheme that now exists in Scotland is funded from that devolved resource? Mark council tax benefit was a reserved benefit. It was abolished. The funding was devolved with a 10% cut which we have had to step in and plug the gap off. Now, in England, as I was saying, there were some councils that chose to absorb the 10% cut in funding within its own budgets, but some who require those not in work, including disabled and carers, to pay 30% of their council tax liability. That's the wrong approach. And instead, this government has implemented policies to try and protect people from the fundamental flaws of the present council tax system. I need to make some progress. But we do all recognise that the present system, I think, perhaps with the exception of the Conservatives, as defined in an Act passed in 1992, is not fit for 2015. So, in our manifesto of 2011, this party this became government committed to consult with others to produce a fairer system based on ability to pay to replace the council tax and to put this to the people at the next election by which time Scotland will have more powers over income tax. This is why the First Minister's statement on the Scottish Government's programme for government last November set out that we would establish an independent commission to examine fairer alternatives to the current system of council tax, advanced in partnership with local authorities and with all political parties invited to be involved. This is why we accepted the recommendation of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee made in its report uh, on the inquiry into flexibility and autonomy of local government from last summer to establish a cross-party commission. And to that end, I'm happy to accept Alex Rowley's amendment, which gives due recognition to the work of that committee. The first steps in establishing this commission reflected our continuing partnership with local government. We found them fully supportive and they proposed a joint chairing by COSLA and the Scottish Government. Those chair roles have now been taken by myself and Councillor David O'Neill, President of COSLA. Our invitation to the other parties to participate in this commission duly followed with a letter jointly from myself and Councillor O'Neill to each, inviting them to discuss potential remit and membership. And I'm grateful to Willie Rennie, Alex Rowley and Patrick Harvey for contributing to this early discussion. That discussion allowed a proposed remit to be refined and developed, and we were happy to take on suggestions. A number of key organisations were identified from outside the world of politics who could contribute, and I would therefore like to record my sincere thanks to them as well, to Citizens Advice Scotland, Joseph Rowntree Foundation, Chartered Institute of Public Finance Accountants, the Law Society of Scotland, the Institute for Society and Social Justice Research, as well as the political parties and the independent group on COSLA for all agreeing to nominate representatives onto the Commission. We met for the first time on Monday of this week. The Commission that we have established, which will be independent from both the Scottish Government and from COSLA, but will report to both, brings many strong voices differing perspectives and experience, as well as an analytical rigour to the process. On the basis of that first meeting earlier this week, I'm confident that the membership has the right mix of skills and knowledge, as well as immense enthusiasm to tackle the task 
it's been set. And that brings me to the remit that has been agreed by everyone participating. The Commission is being asked to examine the alternative systems of taxation to support funding of local government services with a range of what I think will effectively become tests to apply, covering inequalities, macroeconomics, administration, transition, democracy and scale. But in conducting its work, the Commission will engage with communities across Scotland to assess public perception of the emerging findings and to reflect that evidence in its final analysis and recommendations. The Commission isn't being asked to make a specific recommendation, although it is perfectly entitled to if it reaches one particular view. Rather, we envisage that its work will be to develop a profound understanding of all the potential systems. I think it's unimaginable that the next Scottish Government, whoever that is, whichever party or combination of parties that is, will have a policy of maintaining the existing council tax as set out in the 1992 Local Government Finance Act. So this Commission will help us all understand what the alternative propositions are, what they would mean and whether they would be politically viable. The evidence approach that will be taken by the Commission will provide the basis for those alternatives to be more thoroughly developed and informed than otherwise, as well as calibrated against public opinion. The work of the Commission will mean the appropriate knowledge will be in the public domain to allow policy options to be challenged and validated. We have to be realistic, though. Perhaps we have all been missing something, but my expectation is there is no perfect solution. There's probably not going to be one that everybody is going to look at and say, yes, that's the tax that I am happy to pay. Let's do it. The real world is about trade-offs. And the work of this commission can allow us to understand those trade-offs and allow policy to be developed to address them. And we may well take different choices. Instead of thinking about this as delivering a main course, perhaps it will give us a menu from which we can all choose in the knowledge that all the options have been rigorously tested. Additionally, the Commission will look at international practice to see if there is anything that we could learn from abroad and apply to our system here. Furthermore, the work of the Commission can provide an administrative route map for implementing alternatives. And that's key. Because whatever is wrong with the council tax, and I've gone into great length about it, it does deliver £2 billion to the funding for public services. So what replaces it has to be capable of doing similar. And with that £2 billion funding staff and workforce that deliver vital services that have to be planned for for years in advance, revenues would benefit from being stable and predictable. We can't afford a future change that introduces unmanageable revenue risks. Equally, the people of Scotland cannot afford a change that exposes them to unfair or unanticipated tax liabilities. That is just one of those real-world trade-offs that is going to be for the Commission to wrestle with. Council tax fundamentally is of a profound importance to so much of our lives in Scotland, so much of the services we deliver. It has to deliver or its replacement has to deliver financial accountability to local government and transparency to the over 2 million households that currently pay it. Council tax today is visible. Aside from income tax paid by self-assessment or vehicle excise duty, it's the only tax you actually have to make an effort to pay. Every other tax is collected at source by employers and providers of goods and services. But as I have set out, it's a flawed system. And for these reasons, I'm delighted that opposition parties, many civil society groups, recognise the importance of this work. So I move the motion in my name, and I hope that parties in this chamber, in addition to showing their support by participating in the Commission, will also show their support by voting in support of that motion later this afternoon. Thanks. And I now call on Alex Rowley to speak to and move Amendment 124 23.1. Mr Rowley, you have nine minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer, and I'm pleased to move the amendment in my name. I was a bit concerned when I heard um, the Minister start off his speech there that we were going to have the debate today about the merits or otherwise of the council tax and, and what should be replacing that. Um, 
Um, because that's not for today. That is obviously why, why the Commission was set up. And that's why I wanted to amend the motion, because the Local Government Committee, while it carried out its report on flexibility and autonomy of local government, um, heard a lot of evidence for a lot of different people with expertise in local government and in government more generally. Um, and they all you know, raised the issue of local government finance and the fact that we needed to put local government finance on a, on a, 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 a stable footing moving forward. And that's why I think it's important that they, the Local Government Committee, recognised that and highlighted in the report and called for an all-party uh, group to be pulled together to try and, and, and move this thing forward. The Local Government Committee did make the point that local authority funding and expenditure in Scotland in the current year is expected to exceed £11.5 billion across the um, 32 local authorities. And that highlights, I think, just how important local government is uh, to every community across Scotland. And they make the point that these three elements, four elements uh, that make this, this up as council tax, fees, charges, Scottish Government grant and other income. And um, I will say a bit more about the council tax and just the percentage that that actually does make up. Um, but they did say that, that, that one area where there was almost unanimous agreement amongst politicians and parties is that the current system of financing requires to be reformed. That seems to have been a view that has been around for some time. Um, I'm disappointed that the Conservative group have taken the decision not to participate within the Commission. And I say that because, like the Minister, I don't um, have an expectation that we will reach a conclusion and we will then say that's, that's a system of local government finance that needs to be put in place. I think you know, I'm, I'm much more um, keen that, that this Commission looks at the options that's there and is able to provide a useful um, report that all parties can then use to move forward as we set our manifestos and as we look towards finding a, a sustainable way of putting local government finance on. Gavin Brown. I'm grateful to the member for Grimwood. Is it his view then that this Commission will not come up with recommendations? I think the, the Commission um, may, may choose to advise on the, the benefits and merits of each of the different options that it looks at. And if it's informative and if it's able to bring forward a number and a range of options that are available, it will be for the political parties. Because, you know, my own party, for example, does not believe that a local income tax is the best way forward. Um, but other parties may well want to, to, to make that case. But if the Commission is able to look at the merits of local income tax versus property tax, then all that information should be there and should be useful. More importantly, I actually hope, and certainly the discussion that we had at the first meeting, I hope that we will be engaging with Civic Scotland, that we will be engaging with local government itself, and that we will be engaging with communities and individuals right across Scotland um, to, to discuss the merits and discuss the principle of local taxation and local people paying for local services. So there's a wider discussion and a wider debate that I certainly hope in the short timescale that's been set that this Commission will be able to have and engage people right across Scotland. Because th there's no doubt about it at the end of the day, the council tax freeze has been popular. Um, right now, my own party takes the view that it would be wrong to um, introduce increases in charges to the council tax at a time when people, in effect, have had a wage freeze for the last four or five years, and they are facing, at the present time, a crisis in terms of family budgets. So, you know, there has to be a discussion, I think, with communities and with people across Scotland about what type of local government. Indeed, that's a point that I, I read a report um, just, just the other night that was produced by the Commonweal, and they called the, the silent crisis uh, a report on the failure and revival of local democracy in Scotland. And I wasn't aware because they highlight that in 2006, in this parliament, the Local Government Finance Review Committee reported um, 
and I quote, that there is a fundamental question about what the relationship between central and local government should be. There is a long-standing and unresolved debate about the respect of roles. The committee view is that it is essential that the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Executive as it was then, and local authorities grasp the nettle and resolve what appears to be a, cor a corrosive argument about the relationship. You could argue that that was back in 2006. Not a lot has moved on since then. We saw only in the last, the last couple of weeks uh, the Finance Secretary um, threatening to cut the budgets of local authorities over teacher numbers. And the ridiculous situation of that was that actually local authorities across Scotland do not want to cut teacher numbers, but they need the monies to be able to provide the education service in the first place. So this debate around local government and funding local government services seems to have been going on for some time, um, and, and, and yet it has not been resolved. In the 2007, we had a minority SNP government in here that was committed to a local income tax. Um, by 2011, when they had a majority, um, a local Local income tax perhaps didn't seem to be as popular, or it might not uh, look like it would actually work. So, you know, we have we have travelled some distance and not actually made a lot of progress when it comes to financing local government. But hopefully, some of the, my colleagues and some of the speakers today will start to highlight actually why local government is so important and why we need to find a way forward. COSLA last year produced a report with partners the Commission for Local Democracy, um, and, and, and in that published report, they stated that 50 years ago, um, local authorities raised well over 50 per cent of their own income through local taxation. As recently as 1998, around half was still generated in this way. Today, that has fallen to some 18 per cent. Uh, I contacted a number of council leaders, but I thought a response I got from uh, Gordon Matheson, the leader of Glasgow Council, was quite interesting, where he says, I'm disappointed that the remit of the group narrowly focuses upon council tax, which accounts for some 17 per cent of funding to local government and ignores the 83 per cent block of funding that is allocated by the Scottish Government, typically a highly centralised Scottish state. This is a major omission. He goes on to say, since 2008-9, Glasgow's percentage share of the available local government settlement has reduced from 13.9% to 12.8% for 15-16. In cash terms, this equates to a difference of £109 million for 15-16. The distribution formula has a greater impact on Glasgow than the council tax freeze does. Yep. In his last minute, I'm sorry, Mr. Sorry, Stewart. Right. So, the, the, so, so, so the point being that certainly this commission and looking at local taxation and isolation is not going to be the panacea um, for, for, for all the issues in terms of local government finance, and there needs to be a much wider debate, and that's for the political parties to have. When the political parties come forward with their um, proposals and their, for, for, for the elections next year, then how we actually fund local government, not just that 17-18%, but how we fund all the local government and the important role of local government, it seems to me, will be the important issue as we move forward. And just in finishing, uh, President yes, Officer, please. the reason it is so important is because if we look at local government, local government actually does something that this Parliament really doesn't do every day. Every day in local government across Scotland, local authorities are impacting on people's lives. They are delivering services. They are at the coal face when it comes to tackling poverty and inequality, when it comes to jobs we and apprenticeships, when it comes to housing. In all these areas, local government is key. It is far too important right, you must close, for us not to get the answers, and that is why we will be supporting, uh, as amended, the motion that is brought forward today. Thanks very much. And I now call on Gavin Brown. Six minutes, please. Officer, thank you. I have to begin uh, my submission with uh, a degree of surprise, I have to say, from listening to the first two speeches from the SNP and Labour about just what this commission exactly is going to do. I looked at the membership of this commission, and I have to say there were some names I didn't recognise, but many that I did, and I have to say some that I rate particularly highly. So I'm staggered to learn that we're going to get all of these people, some of whom I genuinely rate highly, with a secretariat in a room 
engaging with civic society over the course of a year and at the end of all of that, to quote the Minister, we're just going to produce a menu. And hearing from the Labour Party, their view is that there will be no recommendations from this Commission at the end of all of this work. Presenting officer, I'm genuinely surprised. It sounds just like a talking shop. What is the point of getting all of these people together if we're not actually going to recommend anything at the end of it and it's going to be just a menu from which political parties can pick and choose when drawing up their manifestos for the 2016 elections? I'm happy to give way. Billy Rennie. But, but surely you must recognise it's better to have tried and perhaps failed and be more enlightened rather than not have even bothered at all. Gavin Brown. So the point is, Mr. <laughs> The point is, Mr Ryan, they're not even actually trying on, on the basis of what the Minister said to come up with actually firm recommendations. I'm genuinely now confused about what the purpose of the Commission is, and it sounds to me um, you, you know, generally something that I think um, really needs to be rethought about by the Government, uh, having heard them today. But uh, put that to one side, I mean, Mr Rowley made the point uh, that, that we're going to make. We chose not to, to sit on the Commission uh, we're grateful for the invitation from Mr Biaggi uh, and from Councillor David O'Neill. We talked it through very carefully uh, as a group and as a party and reached the conclusion uh, that we would not uh, be sitting on the Commission for a couple of reasons. Uh, firstly, Deputy Presiding Officer, it was our intention and it is our intention uh, to set up our own Commission looking at finance more widely. The Low Tax Commission was announced by Ruth Davidson at the UK Party Conference in September of last year. It was formally launched as the Commission for Competitive and Fair Taxation this week. And again, I think with a range of commissioners who have experience and I think can bring a lot to the task and who will ultimately produce conclusions and in this case, recommendations on what ought to be done. It will look at taxation widely, but given the size of local taxation, in round figures, it's about uh, £5 billion pounds when you add everything together, an expenditure, of course, well over double that. This will occupy a significant amount of the resources of this group and keep, be a key feature of their recommendations. So our view, Deputy Presiding Officer, is that as a party, we, did, we would put our support behind the work of this group instead of diluting it across two different work streams. Secondly, Presiding Officer, we thought very carefully... Happy to give way to, to Mr. Bruce Crawford. Oh, I wonder if Mr. Brown can, you know, bring together the equation that says, on the one hand, this group is going to produce proposals; it will be independent, but it will also inform the Tory Party manifesto for next year. There does seem to be a rather mixed-up picture emerging from your own particular commission. Evan Brown, Mr. Crawford, like many commissions, which I know he has been involved in and seen, we have set it up, but it will operate independently. Its exact. Uh, work on a weekly basis will not be set by us and their conclusions will be independently reached by those commissioners um, and it's then of course up to the party to decide to take all uh, or most of those recommendations aboard. That's how most independent commissions work uh, Mr Crawford and he ought to know that having sat on one or two himself. But the other reason uh, we didn't go into it is because ultimately we thought very carefully about where this group might end up and in our view given the um, views of, I think, the left-wing parties uh, within this parliament, the cosy left-wing consensus that exists across this chamber, we genuinely don't believe uh, there is almost any prospect of us agreeing with the SNP, or the Greens for that matter, on what local government taxation should look like. We know the Greens want a land value tax. They always have done, and I suspect uh, that will be what they are pushing for. We know the Liberal Democrats want a local income tax. We know the SNP want a national local income tax. We don't know what the Labour Party wants, presiding officer. The Labour Party doesn't know what the Labour Party wants, presiding officer, but we are pretty clear that all of those parties would want to hammer taxpayers in a way that we wouldn't. And the LBTT debates over the course of the budget was a very clear example of this, because none of them batted an eyelid when the punitive rates were announced, including a staggering 10% on homes over £250,000. Labour and the Greens were unhappy 
when Mr Swinney changed his mind and introduced the 5% banding rate. We didn't think he went anywhere near far enough. The SNP, of course, were happy. The Lib Dems, I think, were happy. Labour and the Greens were unhappy that he had moved at all. So ultimately, Deputy Presiding Officer, we're setting up our own commission. We think we're very unlikely to agree. And when it comes down to 2016, we do believe the voters deserve a choice. We believe they deserve a choice based on the independent work done by our commission and, of course, the work done by the commission laid out by the minister earlier on. The government, when they responded to the local government committee, did say very clearly that it should be put to the people. And our concern, I have to say, is that if all of the parties simply agree and put one proposition uh, to the people at the next election, well, that is no choice at all. That's why we are not joining the Commission, why we won't be supporting uh, the motion at decision time today. Thank you. Hey, thanks. And we now move to the open debate, and I call on Kevin Stewart to be followed by Willie Rennie. Tight for time today. Uh, thank you, speeches, President please. Officer. And, uh, can I thank my colleagues in the Local Government and Regeneration Committee uh, for the work that they did uh, on the Flexibility uh, and Autonomy Report? Uh, and one of the aspects that we looked at during the course uh, of our deliberations was the, the legal and constitutional funding mechanisms available to local government. Paragraph 101 of our report says, steps should be taken within the lifetime of this parliament to initiate an agreed approach to facilitate meaningful debate on alternative approaches with the aim of having a new system identified in time for the next local government elections in 2017. We consider this to be the latest appropriate timetable which would enable candidates at that election to put forward their policies linked to revised funding mechanisms. Given the desirability of reaching consensus, we consider this should be done by way of an independent cross-party commission which should include representatives from local government and wider civic society across Scotland. And I am extremely pleased that the government uh, has listened to that recommendation uh, of the Local Government Committee. And I was extremely pleased that every single member of the Local Government Committee signed up to that recommendation including the Conservatives. And I'm quite surprised uh, at the attitude uh, of the Conservatives uh, here today, because what we actually need uh, in dealing uh, with this very thorny subject, let's be honest with you, is the input of Civic Scotland. And what the Tories are basically saying here today is that they are not interested in the views of Civic Scotland. And I am glad that the Labour Party, the Greens and the Liberal Democrats, as well as, well as many members from Civic Scotland, have agreed to join this commission. I'll take Mr Brown. Kevin Brown. That, that, I'm grateful to think about it. That would be a fair criticism, criticism if we were doing nothing. But given that we have set up our own commission, who will engage extremely widely, surely that's an unfair criticism. Well, I, I, this, this is the kind of situation that you face every day in a playground, uh, where if somebody uh, disagrees with uh, your point of view, you take the ball home. That is what the Tories have done here uh, in terms of, of uh, what they have decided to do. Um, and I feel that they have put uh, their own representative on the Local Government Committee here in a really bad place. Because I have to say that the debate in that committee uh, was pretty, pretty immense uh, in terms of the points that we got to. Now, there are often times where we have disagreements uh, about certain things, but we agreed completely and utterly that this was the right approach to take. And I'm pleased, as I say, that the government have listened to what we have, to have said and have taken that approach. It's just a pity that the Conservatives have chosen to take their ball home on this one. And I think, you know, in some regards, they will miss out on having uh, the views uh, of civic uh, Scotland when it comes to the formulation of, of their own policy, uh, which, uh, let's be honest with you, probably won't be up to, to much anyway. Uh, Mr Brown uh, says that uh, all of the parties uh, involved in this commission uh, will hammer taxpayers. Well, I'd like to point out to, to Mr Brown that during the course uh, of uh, this parliament and the previous parliament, uh, that this government has ensured that taxpayers have not been hammered. 
They have chosen to freeze the, the, the council tax for eight years. That's something that I'm very pleased about, because between uh, 1996 and 97 uh, and 2007 eight council tax in Aberdeen on average, on the average house, rose by 81.9%. That was a burden that people in Aberdeen could not bear. Uh, I'm really pleased that that burden hasn't been added to uh, over um, the piece. But we do recognise, you know, that this system is not perfect. But during the course of this, this government has ensured that hard-pressed families have been uh, protected. So in terms of hammering taxpayers, uh, I would suggest to Mr Brown that the very opposite has been the case uh, when it comes to this government uh, and the council tax. Um, I'm pleased that the, uh, uh, the remit um, and uh, the membership uh, of this independent commission. Um, and I hope that it will look at a, a, a number of things uh, when it carries out its business, presiding officer. And I, I just want to, to touch on, on one thing. I, I wrote to the, the government recently um, about uh, the provision for, for carers within the council tax system in Scotland. Uh, and I got a response back um, from the, uh, the Deputy First Minister, um, who suggests um, that uh, what we should do in terms of, uh, of this commission is that they should look at issues uh, such uh, as this one. And I hope um, that that commission will agree to look at issues uh, round about how carers have to pay into the, the local taxation system, as well as other hard-pressed folk uh, within our society. And what I would say finally, uh, presiding officer, is that I wish uh, everyone on that commission all of the best. I would encourage Civic Scotland to engage with that commission. And again, I'm pleased that we have moved forward as per the recommendations of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. Many thanks. And I now call on Willie Rennie to be followed by Claire Adamson. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I've spent five years in uh, the, the last five years being accused of by all sorts of people in this chamber and beyond of being right wing. It's so refreshing <laughs> to be called left wing. So I thank Gavin Brown. If for nothing else, I thank him just uh, for that. Um, this, this commission is not, however, about deciding whether tax should be high or low. This is about trying to come up with a taxation system that will work not just for Scotland but for local government. So when Gavin Brown indicates that what he's interested in is low tax, that's no bar to being involved in this commission. He could be equally involved in that and then subsequently argue that whatever we came up with should involve a low tax element. That's up to him and his party to be able to decide. And I think it would be advisable, just a second, um, I think it would be advisable if Gavin Brown did seek the advice of others from other political parties. Um, and I know that he's got his own commission, but there's very many more people are going to be involved in this too. But I think he should seek the advice of others because the Conservative track record on coming up with a local government taxation system is not a good one. And the last time they came up with a taxation system for local government, it was not a universally successful and approved system. And in fact, it had to be abandoned in a very short space of time. So perhaps he might like to reflect on the history and come back and decide to join this commission, if nothing else, just to save him from himself. I will take an intervention. Gavin Brown. Dems would be advised to study more recent history, I think, of uh, electoral success, Deputy Presiding Officer. But, but responding to whether, listening to him then, is it his view then that this Commission will come up with a recommendation for a tax system? I think that would be our ambition. I think what we should be aiming for is trying to come up with a consensus. I think all Commissions should be looking towards that. But I do not think we should bind ourselves into absolutely having an agreement. What I think we should be doing is trying to shine a light because there are an awful lot of misunderstandings, misconceptions about local government finance. I think there's a big argument to be had, as Alex Rowley quite rightly pointed out, about the balance of local authority funding between different regions within Scotland, but also the balance between central government and local government. I think we need to look at that to make sure we have a sustainable system. That's what I think this Commission should be looking at. So we are far, far better informed 
about how local government should be financed. Now, if we can't come up with an agreement, at least if we have a better understanding, then we're many steps further forward than when we otherwise would have been. Local government finance has been far too party politicised in recent years. I think it's an admirable step from the committee, but also from the government, to try and bring everybody in together. I partly think it's to try and get the SNP off a hook that they find themselves with a policy that they're perhaps not so convinced about anymore. But nevertheless, the fact that they are look, looking and willing to work with others, I think, is a good thing. If you look at, in the, year eight, in the 1870s, 4.5% of local government finances were provided by central government. 1880s, 9.8%. 16% in 1928, 1970s, it went up to 60%. It's now, in 1990, it was up at 85% was provided by central government. That needs to change if we're going to give local authorities the true flexibility that they need and they aspire to have. Because Scotland, just like the United Kingdom, is a diverse country with greatly differing needs. And some areas might like lower levels of tax, some want higher level of tax, but just now they are bound into a system that means they have to follow whatever Edinburgh says has to happen. And any idea that the council tax freeze is anything more than a straitjacket, I think, is nonsense. And that's, I believe, one of the principles that we should be trying to establish with any kind of outcome that we agree on this commission. I think it needs to involve flexibility, true freedom for local government, so that they can decide what is best for their communities. In addition to fairness, now, Liberal Democrats have been strong advocates of local income tax. We believe a local income tax, truly local, not a central income tax provided to local government, but a local income tax where you've got variability at local level, is something that we should have strived for. It's something that we've campaigned for for many years. We know there are weaknesses in the system. Other people have pointed them out. But actually trying to strive towards a system that is based on the ability to pay is something that we should be working towards. Now, we'll be putting that idea into the Commission. Others will be putting other ideas in as well. And in true Liberal Democrat fashion, we will have our ears wide open and we'll be listening to what other parties have got to say. Because if we can come to a consensus on this that will result in substantial change, that will shine a light on how local government is financed, then I think we'll have provided a great service to the country. We might not all agree. I would like us to agree if we possibly can, but I, we might not agree. And even if we don't, if we shine a light, that will be significant progress. We should look, as the minister says, right around the world to see what works. There probably are no missing great answers out there. Probably it's all the way before us because any change is difficult. We've seen what happened in Wales where there was a revaluation and it was incredibly unpopular. So we should be careful whatever we do with this, but also strive to have that freedom and fairness as sound principles for any change. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Many thanks. Now calling Claire Adamson to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am very pleased that the Commission on Local Tax Reform is underway and has already had its first meeting. And I was delighted to read about the um, makeup of that commission. And I particularly um, welcome the fact that Angela Hagen is there as a research fellow of the Institute of Society of Social Justice Research and convener of the Scottish Women's Budget Group. I'm very pleased because I think um, women sometimes have been let down by local government and we consider the equal pay issues across Scotland at the moment. I think a women's voice, a strong, but a strong academic voice on that, that commission is, is very, very welcome indeed. I also welcome the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, Civic Scotland being involved and indeed my colleague for the local government, Alex Rowley, has considerable experience in local government who will bring much in his role as Shadow Minister for Local Government and Community, Community Empowerment to that role. I do agree with him and regret that the Conservatives have taken the decision not to be part of this commission. I think this commission is an opportunity for us to try and reach a consensus in the Parliament, given all the recent work that's been done on local democracy throughout this Parliament and by um, colleagues in COSLA. And I, I do really think that the, the Conservative parties have been missing out there. However, my experience of being in the Welfare Reform Committee is that even faced with overwhelming evidence that there are problems uh, in the austerity um, budgets and the welfare reform is having a detrimental effect on people and has led to increased use 
of food banks, the fact that the Conservatives in Westminster um, don't acknowledge what detrimental effect the welfare reform has on the most vulnerable in our society makes me believe that perhaps there'll not be much missed from the Commission. And I really think that the people that will involve will come up with um, some, some good, um, good menus, good propositions of, of what may be possible going forward. I'm going to just pick up on Alex Rowley's comments. I, I do really hope that we have consensus in this and that we can work going forward, but I don't think it helps with some of the language around um, the relationship with local government at the moment. Uh, no council in Scotland was prevented from raising the council tax, none at all. They had that option to go and raise the council tax. Had they done so, they would have to have explained to their constituents why they were wanting to increase it, even to stand still with the funding from the Scottish Government. That would have meant going forward with the average 3.5, 3.6 increases just to stay still. And then they would have had to explain to the constituents why this was increasing again to raise any additional meaningful money. So we were talking about the horrendous case again highlighted by Mr Stewart showing over 80% increases in Aberdeenshire. What this would have meant for the local authority I served as a councillor in and for my constituents now in, in North Lanarkshire is, is very specific and I hope the Minister will um, and the Commission will take on board the geographic and demographic, uh, demographic and um, pressures that are on different areas in Scotland to ensure that whatever replaces this system reflects and is fair to the people in the area. Because in North Lanarkshire, 82% of the population live in band D or below valued houses. It's over 50% of the population in band B or below houses. When you look at that, and also that in a recent um, house price survey, Wishaw in North Lanarkshire, my hometown, had one of the lowest rises in house property values in the whole of the UK. So the experience of people in North Lanarkshire on the whole is, is cannot be compared to Aberdeen or Edinburgh City or other areas where house prices and land values have increased to a great, res great respect. So for, from my point of view, I think any increase in the council tax would have been so detrimental to ordinary hardworking people that it was not something we could ever have contemplated. And I'm so glad that the Scottish Government um, asked for the council tax freeze. Taking, thank you for taking an intervention. Does the member agree that the people in better off uh, areas with higher tax bands, council tax bands, actually benefit more than those in the lower tax bands from the council tax freeze? Mayor Adamson. Well, I, as I said, yeah, it's not a fair tax. It's never been a fair tax. And the freeze has put a stop to the, the um, horrendous increases a lot of which were through Labour-controlled councils in increasing that. But the Minister pointed out that increase in the tax, the, the tax man doesn't even represent the doubling in value, as it was pointed out when he was responding to Mr Brown. So it has been unfair. It is unfair. And it's, that's why we should come together in the Commission and get behind the Commission in their work in coming up with a system that is truly fair. But I don't think the council tax freeze was the wrong thing to do at all by any stretch of their imagination. And I don't think the Scottish people would have sold any of the ridiculous 80-odd percent increases in this tax over time. No other tax as well. No, I'm not going to take another last 40 intention. seconds. I'm struggling for time now to finish. So um, I welcome the fact that um, Mr Rowley mentioned the effect of democracy reconnecting with communities. I think this is an excellent document about how we should proceed and look and work together in, in not only because we can't take individual decisions about financing, it has to be about our whole communities, empowering communities, our whole democracy as a whole. And I think from, from that document it says making Scotland a fairer, healthier and wealthier you place will not close, be achieved please? without a democracy which people can see how decisions are made and where communities are active participants in that process. And I think the Commission will take us a long way towards reaching that goal for our, our constituents. Many thanks. And I now call on Anne McTaggart to be followed by Chick Brodie. Thank you, President Officer. And as a former member of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, I am pleased to speak in this debate today and to support, to support my colleague Alec Rowley's amendment, which recognises the work of the committee and its call for the establishment 
of this cross-party commission on finding an alternative to council tax. I will speak later about the time that I spent on the committee where we did develop um, what was to become the eighth report examining flexibility and autonomy in local government and the European fact-finding sessions, which shaped much of our conclusions. Firstly, I would like to speak about my own experience serving as an elected member in local government. In particular, I want to highlight the important work being done by local government and the vital services it provides to some of our most vulnerable and deprived citizens. It is this experience that, through services such as social work and social care, local government is on the front line, tackling inequality and poverty and caring for our elderly and disabled citizens. It is local government which carries the responsibility for educating our children, local government which is often tasked with helping those who cannot access employment gain the skills they need to do so, and it is also local government which houses those who have nowhere else to reside. I would argue that local government is the most important tier of government and certainly the most visible to our citizens. In my own area of Glasgow, it has been the City Council leading the fight to tackle poverty and inequality by working within our most disadvantaged communities to increase skills and get people back into work. It is the Glasgow City Council which has led the way in introducing a living wage across the city to protect our lowest paid workers. And yet, President Officer, despite the importance of local government and the vital work carried out by local authorities such as Glasgow City Council, councils across Scotland have seen austerity plus passed down from this very government. Glasgow, for example, has lost £370 million in total since the SNP government came into power. The Scottish Government's own figures show that if Glasgow got the same share of the local government budget as it did under the Labour administration, it would have an extra £96 million in its funding this year alone. Yes. And Stuart. Officer. Um, what I would ask Ms McTaggart, would she um, join me uh, in uh, calling on COSLA to have a full review of the funding formula, which I think would benefit my constituents uh, in Aberdeen, and which is something that I've called for for a very long time? And McTaggart? Mm -hmm. And I'm not really sure if that's going to be on the menu, shall we say, um, for this commission, but it is something that does have to be addressed. Mr Stewart. Um, right, where was I? Right. It is clear to me that local government is not being properly funded in Scotland and, a vital public, and the vital public services are suffering as a consequence. We must be honest about the pressures our councils are facing. Tough and unpopular... Can... <sighs> Okay, quickly. Crawford. During the, a debate recently in Parliament uh, on local government financing, I challenged a number of Labour speakers to tell us how much more they would put into local government uh, settlement and where that would come from. Can you enlighten us on that, please? Anne McTaggart. It sounds like a Green Party moment now, doesn't it, for, for to get these figures rattled off the top of my head. I know, I know. Mr Crawford. Yes, we would want to see an increase, and yes, we would want to see some restructuring there. But to have the figures to the top of my head, my apologies. Anyway, tough and unpopular decisions do have to be made, and those kind of popular, unpopular decisions are exactly what Bruce Crawford has, has really kind of implied, implied there. Budgets need to be stretched to breaking point, and this is unsustainable. We must now agree to find a way to move forward and we must agree that local government should be properly funded and vital public services must be protected. Therefore, I do welcome the Cross-Party Commission on finding an alternative to the council tax and I am glad that the work done by the Local Government and Regeneration Committee is being taken forward in this way. Oh no, I've not got time. Um, one of the things that... Um, during 
taken evidence within the local government committee, we did seek some evidence from European countries. And one of the things which did become immediately apparent to me was across Europe, local government is changing to meet the new demands and priorities of its citizens. I believe that this, in this country, our local government must change too. The Community Impairment Bill currently passing through the Local Government Committee gives us an opportunity to bring about some of this change, but communities will not be impaired if the money is not available there to back this up and support them. Presiding Officer, I see you rolling over, so I will come to my conclusion. Presiding Officer, in conclusion, I welcome this Commission and will be following its progress extremely carefully. I also welcome the acknowledgement of the work done by the Local Government Committee in its establishment. However, I do feel we must be open and honest about the challenges which lie ahead, and that also is about what funding does it need in the future. For local government and its pressures, our councils face. I hope that we can now begin to move forward and find an alternative to council tax, which is fairer, well, more, pro more progressive, and meets the needs of local government. I also hope, presiding officer, that we can now have an honest and open discussion about the challenges facing local government and the need to properly fund our most vital public services. Thanks Thank very you. Much. Well done. And I call on Chick Brodie to be followed by Margaret McCullough. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the debate today. Presiding Officer, some ten years ago, I think, I sat in the gallery of uh, the Parliament listening to a raging debate on uh, local taxation and loud support for a local income tax by the then uh, opposition. And then, uh, so now, it was clear that the sole and existing uh, property-based system of local taxation was neither progressive nor was it fair, proportionate nor was it efficient, nor was it timious, nor did it achieve all it should uh, and, and that we should move to uh, strengthen a local autonomy and democracy through a proper taxation system. In pursuit of our principles as enshrined in the uh, Communities Empowerment Bill, we must, we must address a fundamental change in the financing of our local authorities, however they might be structured in future, as that, that uh, a local democracy uh, and autonomy, uh, so that that might be achieved. <clears throat> we can no longer exist with the current regime that council tax, which we have rightly frozen over the last year, eight years, given the straightened UK in national economic circumstances, and that that council tax uh, might eventually become a, and should become a lost element in the history of local tax revenue garnering. And while we recognise that uh, uh, compulsive action by central government working, working with COSLA has buttressed local government funding both through maintaining annual revenue and capital funding at current levels uh, in 2015-16 in with new allocations uprated uh, by finance for new, new responsibilities allocated to local authorities. And it is to be applauded that local government budgets over the period 2007-08 to 2012-13 have increased by 9%, demonstrating an accord between COSLA and the Scottish Government over that difficult financial period, and hopefully, and I know it will be, mirrored in the relationship uh, in joining this Commission. And I'm, I'm confused by, uh, by Mr Brown's statement that he will consult with Civic Scotland. Is he expecting a different answer uh, from them that they give uh, to, to the uh, proposed Commission, and it's shameful, frankly, that they have not participated and made this a consensual effort. But, Presiding Officer, that requirement, if anything, highlighted uh, uh, the need to change and meet certainly our manifesto commitment to replace what is an iniquitous uh, council tax. Presiding Officer, if Scotland is to compete economically and globally, then the funding of local government, the funding of local government and its nature must change. If we are to empower communities, then so must we empower local authorities uh, and their associated communities to set them free to achieve returns on local investment in innovation, efficiency and productive achievement. If, if we are to compete seriously, then we have to consider that competitive countries, particularly in Europe, 
Have local governments with... Yes, I've, I'm Sorry, I've enjoyed the, the last 30 seconds or so of the member's speech. Um, does, does he then think that this new system, given what he's just said, should be a lower tax system than the one we currently have? Rudy. I think you missed the point when I talked about setting local authorities free. It should be right for them to determine the level of tax a, a, a gathering and tax revenue that is appropriate for their circumstances. And that competitiveness uh, that I was about to mention regarding Europe it will, I believe, it can, uh, it provide competition between local authorities, and that in itself will uh, uh, improve our economic uh, capabilities. So we have to look at uh, Europe. I said local governments with equivalent responsibilities to Scotland garner at least 50% of their income locally, whereas we have, uh, as Willie Rennie pointed out, a base currently of some 20%. Local communities should and must have the right to determine whether they wish to pay more for better governance and consequent better services or not in their local area. So in staying faithful to its remit, I'm sure the Commission will, in a short time span, construct positive proposals that will embrace not just fairness and efficiency, but will set about using the adopted local taxation system or systems to eradicate inequalities in our local areas and secure the well-being of each and every one of its citizens. That they will use it to hand power back, hand power back to these citizens, and that we will ensure that there is then more direct engagement through that with local people. Presiding officer, we will each of us have a view on what that local taxation base might encompass. There will be those of us who seek a combination of a form of local income tax married to a site valuation tax system with regular assessment of land values as opposed to the current unfair property values. Both taxes, progressive, fair, more equal, embracing personal income and asset positions and demanding more accountability from local representatives. That, of course, will be down uh, to the Commission. I do, however, suggest a brief stopover in Denmark, particularly to assess the impact of site valuation tax and an income local income tax close, on local and national economies. That might be helpful. Presiding officer, the Commission is most welcome. Its recommendations and the consequent actions which will follow will be even more so. Many thanks. And I now call on Margaret McCullough to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate today on a subject which I believe the Scottish Parliament has had to confront for some time. We cannot defer reform of local taxation again for another term and another parliament. We cannot lurch from one fix to the next, knowing that long-term damage has been done to public services. We cannot continue to tax properties today on the basis of a valuation last conducted in 1991. We cannot pretend that council tax freeze is anything than underfunded. As Unison, the leading trade union for local government workers, have said, we need to develop a new consensus that provides a long-term solution. I would therefore congratulate, congratulate the Local Government and Regeneration Committee for showing leadership on this issue by recommending that an independent cross-party commission on local taxation be established. In doing so, I hope they have brought about the means by which we can finally address the serious mountain issues surrounding the finances, finances of local government. Presiding officer, figures cited by Unison indicate that council tax only accounts for about a fifth of the income of our councils in Scotland. There will be variations from one local authority to the next. For instance, there have been times when the income generated in South Lanarkshire has been greater than in its, than in its larger neighbour, North Lanarkshire, where the level of need and deprivation is greater. This is because the council tax, as said before, as a property-based tax, is based on a yield from tax and property values, and the values of properties in some, in some of South Lanarkshire suburbs will be higher. However, the overall share of income generated through council tax relative to grants from central government has been declining everywhere, and it will have declined further since the council tax freeze was introduced. And so while a review of local taxation is welcome, we cannot lose sight of wider issues in the financing of local government. We have to be clear about the remit of this Commission. 
what it does do and what it doesn't do, because council tax is just one income stream. There have been several reviews into non-domestic rates. One such review is ongoing at present into the cumbersome appeals process. More and more businesses are appealing, and so our assessors and valuation boards are swamped. Many business have been, businesses have told me that valuations are completely out of kilter with the property market. The last valuation was postponed, and so taxes are effectively being levelled at properties at pre-recession values. Our experience of business rates may offer us some lessons for the Commission if they decide to continue with some form of property taxation. I would also draw the Government's attention to the impact that changes in the Scottish Government grants are having at local level. For example, South Lancashire Council have advised that while grant levels for 2016-17 are not yet available, they expect they will have to revise their budget strategy for the financial year beyond 2017. Their previous, previous budget strategy from May 2013 to 2016-17 assumed there would be a consistent level of central funding. That has not proven to be the case. South Lancashire Council have also warned that if this Parliament is to make laws which have obvious financial implications for local authorities, then this should ideally be reflected in their funding. In evidence to the Education Committee, the Council specifically highlighted costs arising from new legislation on additional support for learning as an area where the Council want to meet the expectations of the Parliament but are struggling because of financial constraints. These issues are so important because grants account for so much of a Council's income. Finally, President Officer, I would draw the Chamber's attention to the work of the Scottish Women's Budget Group, which I raised with the First Minister during our recent public session of the Conveners Group. The Budget Group directly challenged the assertions in this year's Budget Equality Statement that there is parity in the Council tax freeze. They do not accept that it helps people in low incomes because of cuts to Council services, which those in need depend on most. And so I would simply remind the Government and members of the Commission of the need to consider the distributional effects of any changes in their entirety. What does it mean for those on low incomes? What does it mean for those who depend on council, council services the most? And what does it mean for women and those who already face the greatest inequalities? In conclusion, President Officer, the Local Government and Regeneration Committee have helped the Scottish Government and this Parliament take an important step. They have not only recommended that we examine these issues, but they have recommended that we do it in the right way, with an independent all-party commission. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Cameron Buchanan. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I welcome today's debate and also the establishment of this uh, commission. Uh, and I would, I actually would, however, like to ask the Conservative Party to actually reconsider their position and actually take an active part in helping to actually devise a modern, fairer alternative to the council tax. No tax is popular, and we've already heard that today, but no tax is popular. But this commission uh, that's, uh, that's been uh, organised, well, actually, it, it can actually help to actually generate that new, fairer chance of actually being accepted uh, across the country as well. But also, I think it would be accepted even more so if there was total cross-party uh, activity uh, in this, and uh, certainly also allowing for all of the voices in Scotland to actually have a say in the creation of an alternative to the council tax. But before examining, I think, the role of the Commission uh, and uh, the possible alternatives open uh, to them, I think it's important to actually highlight the current situation regarding the funding of local government in Scotland and also uh, the problems with the council tax. And in contrast to actually what is happening in England, the Scottish Government actually has protected local government funding uh, with the 2015-16 the budget, providing a total funding package of over £10.85 billion, with further funding available to maintain the teacher numbers. And between 2007-08 and 2012-13, uh, the resources within the Scottish Government's control increased by 6.4%, and over the same period, local government's budget increased by 8.9%, demonstrating the strong financial settlements agreed with local government during challenging financial times. I think the difference between local government funding in Scotland and in England was highlighted by Councillor Sir Merrick Cockle, who is the chairman of the, the Local Government Association, who, following the 2013 UK spending review, said 
Every year I meet my opposite numbers in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland and they listen to us in wide-eyed disbelief at the budget cuts we are enduring and they are not. In looking at any alternative, it is important to review the record of the council tax and to ensure that the failings of this form of taxation are not repeated when discussing a new system of funding for local government. And the council tax system is unfair it's and it is also regressive. It taxes a higher proportion of the value of cheaper properties compared to expensive ones, and it bears little relation to a household's ability to pay. People on low incomes, including pensioners and those in low-wage employment, can pay 20 per cent or more of their incomes in council tax, while those who are better off can pay 1 per cent or less of their incomes. And the abolition of council tax benefit by the UK Government resulted in the funds for supporting these or those on low incomes being devolved to Scotland, but with a 10 per cent cut. And the Scottish Government, in cooperation with COSLA, managed to actually plug this gap. Without this action, over 530,000 low-income households, including 200,000 pensioners, would be facing a massive rise in their bills, as has happened in some areas in England. Before the fully funded council tax freeze, local communities were facing enormous rises in their council tax bill. If some, I mean, across the country, council tax bills are up by 46 per cent. And I know that other parties have actually suggested altering uh, the tax bans uh, to try to improve the council tax, but quite simply, this isn't going to be enough. No amount of alteration uh, to tax bans or minor changes can substantially improve this tax, and it simply has to be replaced. And the establishment uh, of this Commission on Local Tax Reform is a positive step forward in devising a fairer, more progressive alternative to the council tax. And I am pleased that the Commission has general cross-party support, except from the Conservatives, and also involves external advice from the third sector and other bodies who can contribute their expertise and their experience. And we need to examine all the options available, both domestically and internationally, to find a fairer alternative system. Uh, I mean, my colleague Chick Brodie mentioned about Denmark. I, mean, I, mean, I certainly mean, I mean, look at Denmark, look at, look at elsewhere as well. Uh, I, th I think it's also welcome that this Commission remit is not prescriptive, allowing it to look at alternative systems whilst considering the impact on individuals, households and inequalities in income and wealth. It is important that future local taxes uh, should embrace the established taxation principles of efficiency, convenience, certainty and of being proportionate to the taxpayer's ability to pay. This certainly will be no easy task for the Commission and I am sure that many organisations and individuals will have their own preference for a new system of taxation. There are certainly arguments both uh, for and against local income tax, or land value tax, or even a hybrid form of taxation based on both property and income. However, I'm sure that the Commission will be up to the task. And certainly, uh, gently to the Conservatives, some years ago, the, the Constitutional Convention uh, was established and the, and the SNP withdrew from it uh, because the issue of independence wasn't allowed to be discussed. This Commission on Local Tax Reform has a remit to identify and examine a well, fairer alternative systems and the Commission's remit is not prescriptive. And I know, I know why the SNP came out of the Constitutional Convention. I can't understand why the Tories don't want to take part in this cross-party and non-party commission. It's not prescriptive. If all the political parties can actually come to a compromise on constitutional matters, then surely it uh, should be a lot easier to actually come to a compromise on local taxation. Alex Rowley, uh, mentioned the word compromise in his contribution. And this, comp this commission allows that to happen. But obviously the Conservatives don't agree and they obviously don't think that compromise is that important. But I warmly welcome this commission and I wish it every success. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Cameron Buchanan to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is welcome to have the opportunity to discuss the best way forward for local taxation. Although the Scottish Government is seeking to debate exclusively about the Commission on Local Tax Reform, it seems that such an important issue as tax should not be restricted to such limits. The discussion should not be confined to political parties' negotiations, but rather consider what form and level of taxation would produce the best outcomes for the public. We need a practical, well-rounded and sustainable tax system. We therefore need a wide-ranging inquiry concerning not just the council tax, but the whole range of taxes devolved to Scotland. For this reason, we have set up a Commission for Competitive and Fair Taxation. With new powers coming to Parliament, 
the opportunity is there for a broad reconsideration of multiple levels of taxation. We need to get all taxes right to have an enterprising economy that will attract talent, create jobs and finance our public services. This should be the aim of taxation policy with the public's best interests put first. The Commission on Local Tax Reform, unfortunately, I think will kick this issue into the long grass by freezing the political debate meantime. Its premise is built around making deals between parties with the ultimate aim of being a situation whereby whichever way the electorate votes in future elections, there will be no option of change to the local tax, issue, tax system. Sorry, I need to press on. The Scottish, the Scottish Conservatives will not allow this to happen. It is only right that parties can openly offer alternatives to the government's view and the public are given a real and meaningful choice. We will consider at length the recommendations of the Commission for Competitive and Fair Taxation. Sorry, thank you. I'm going to press on. Uh, for competitive and fair taxation and continue our drive for an enterprising economy that sustainably funds its public services and delivers for everyone. The merits of varying approaches should then be decided by voters rather than deal-making politicians in the local commission on local tax on the commission on local tax reform. Sorry. <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> The recently set up Commission for Competitive and Fair Taxation, on the other hand, will have the interests of, taxation, of taxpayers at its heart. An economy overburdened with tax will struggle to reach its potential and taxes that are too low and will not allow for sufficient funding of our public services. The point is that taxes need to be very carefully thought through. Furthermore, it seems plain to me that a well-rounded approach considering of all the taxes devolved to Scotland would be far more practical and sustainable than a bit-by-bit -bit, bit -bit approach. It is indeed worth looking at our approach to local tax, but for a system to be a coherent, competitive and fair, a much wider outlook, I think, is needed. Finally, I would like to highlight a crucial attribute of this Commission. It is independent. It is formed of experts who are independent of the Scottish Conservative Party and would like their recommendations to be considered by all parties. It will have six members, chaired by the former CBI Scotland Director, Ian McMillan, CBE, whom together bring a wealth of expertise to business economies and tax. Accordingly, Presiding Officer, I would like to reiterate my belief that when it comes to taxation, the key principles applied should be competitiveness and fairness. Most local authorities are facing financial difficulties at the moment, which only serves to highlight the need for sensible and sustainable taxation policies. With so much at stake, the public must be given a choice rather than a political deal, and it is for this reason that the Scottish Conservatives do not think it would be appropriate for all discussion of local taxation to be limited to the Commission on Local Tax Reform. Instead, as you've heard, we've launched an expert commission for competitive and fair taxation that aims to produce practical and fair recommendations and allow the public to judge for themselves. Thank you. Thank you. I call Roger Campbell to be followed by Cara Hilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like others, I welcome the appointment of the Commission on Local Tax Reform and I wish it well with its deliberations. How we finance local government, as other speakers have suggested, is not an easy question. And exploring the issue across the political landscape has to be the right way forward. Therefore, I'm equally disappointed that the Conservatives are not participating in this Commission. Uh, I agree with Willie Rennie that I think it's better to have tried than never to have tried at all. And I also agree with him that hopefully this Commission, at the very least, will succeed in shedding some light on these very uh, difficult questions. As we know, if we finance local government spending disproportionately from national taxation, then of course the local element of accountability is reduced. We know that many local authorities, such as East Lothian, uh, believe that local accountability has been weakened by the continuing erosion of local government's fiscal autonomy. Others would contend, however, that the public are not necessarily concerned with the source of local government funding, provided that services are maintained. And clearly there is not necessarily a universal understanding that at the present time more than 80% of local government expenditure is received from central government. In Scotland we've had a council tax freeze which has capped the overheads for many hard-pressed families over the last eight years with considerable success despite uh, the concerns and opposition of some local authorities. And I was glad that Alec Rowley accepted that the council tax freeze at the present time was uh, popular. But we should bear in mind also that despite criticism of the Scottish Government, the position of local government in Scotland at a time of austerity has been better protected than south of the border, as David O'Neill has conceded. Demands on local government are, of course, increasing. We have to accept that the days of such council tax freezes must inevitably be drawing to a close. 
and it's right and proper that we work towards a revised system of local finance in good time for the next local elections in 2017. Council tax is clearly a blunt instrument. Certainly in terms of reducing inequality, it can be easily criticised. My colleague Stuart McMillan has talked about previous plans to increase the number of bans at higher levels, but that was really something which was tinkering and wouldn't have had a significant impact. But I have to accept, of course, the Scottish Government's own land and buildings tax sets rates which the Scottish Government believe are more proportionate to house prices while seeking to protect those at the bottom of the housing ladder. So uh, you know, banding and playing with, with rates at the top is, is not something which is uh, completely alien to, to this Government. Income tax nationally collected, of course, contains the redistributive element in its rates, although I accept for many who favour rates of income tax in excess of 45%, that may not be redistributive enough. But in seeking to fund local government, of course, by local income tax, that redistributive element would be maintained. But in any system moving forward, ability to pay has to be central to any replacement. Indeed, the Commission's remit makes it clear that future taxes should be proportionate to the taxpayer's ability to pay. But what does that mean in practice? Is, is it right, for example, that single folk should receive discounts or exemptions from local taxation otherwise payable, irrespective of their ability to pay? If you own property or land, these are assets that have a value upon which monies can generally be raised. That any tax based on value should reflect that. And in nat national taxation, we do not tax on the basis of the extent of usage of public services by individual taxpayers. So it's not clear to me why similar considerations should not apply to local taxation. For those on fixed incomes of whatever age, however, who may be capital rich but income light, that presents a problem, a problem which local income tax might have avoided. But grappling with this kind of issue has to be part of the Commission's thinking. I'm not sure of the details of the mansion tax, but if it's purely a tax on value, I'm assuming that that kind of concession will not be made. I don't know if anyone on the Labour benches can enlighten me as to the details of the mansion tax, but uh, I'll leave that open for anyone to in interrupt me on that point. And what about charges, a thorny area? The more so in a time of austerity. Whilst I don't accept the argument they should be considered a form of local taxation, uh, at the present time, these charges can uh, cause considerable distress to the disadvantaged. Kevin Stewart's talked about the position of carers. Um, so I, I don't know how um, charges fit into the helping tackling inequality agenda. And I hope this is something that the Commission will pay some attention to. Uh, and is it right that charges should fall fully within the local authority's discretion? It's certainly wor worthy of debate. And of course, what about local authority commercial enterprises? How do they feature in the assessment of local government finance? Can they play a bigger role? What impact would they have financially in looking at the whole question of uh, local government funding? And what about council tax benefit and its successor, the council tax reduction scheme, tied in, of course, with the concept of the ability to pay? How should that operate? At the present time, more than half a million people benefit from that, but clearly that has a bureaucracy attached to it. Is that inevitable with any scheme based on ability to pay? Clearly, again, that's something for the Commission to consider. Presiding officer, I'm not sure what can be gained from international experience. I think Mr. Brodie referred to Denmark earlier on, and I know that members of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee visited Germany, Denmark, and Sweden, but hopefully the Commission will cast a wide net in trying to learn from international experience. In conclusion, presiding officer, whilst we may agree that the present system of local government is, is broken, as the Scottish Labour Devolution Com Commission indicated, Finding an alternative fit for purpose will not be an easy task. I wish the Commission well. Thank you very much. And I now call Cara Hilton to be followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you, President Officer. Um, how our local councils are funded is certainly one of the most contentious issues, not just in Scotland, but across the UK. And this is no surprise when we consider that it's often local government that has the biggest impact on people's lives, from the education our children receive to how often our bins are collected. The decisions that local councils make touch people's lives in a more direct way than many of the decisions we take here at Holyrood or down at Westminster. Strong local democracy empowers local people to be in charge of their own lives and to decide the priorities of their local communities. Yet a report by the Carnegie UK Trust found that only 21% of adults in Scotland agree that they can influence decisions affecting their local area. 
Across the chamber, and we've seen it in the debate today, most of, most of us agree that devolution shouldn't stop at Holyrood. Devolution should be about ensuring that all decisions that are taken as close as possible to the communities they affect and that local people are involved in shaping these priorities. An important principle of local democracy should be that councils are accountable to the communities they serve for the decisions that they make. Yet increasingly, we've seen that local councils um, are losing that power and Scotland's become more centralised in the past few decades. Increasingly, our local councils are at breaking point and it's disappointing that it's taken so long um, for this debate that we're having today to happen, but it, it welcome, it's welcome that it's now taking place. We talk a lot in this chamber about empowering communities and ensuring that the power to shape our lives is in our own hands, but when it comes to local democracy, our local authorities' hands are increasingly tied. Yet we only have to look at what our councils are achieving to imagine how they could transform our communities further with more freedom and with more financial resources to do so. There is absolutely no doubt that the reform is needed. And the fact that such a very small proportion of the money that local authorities spend is actually raised locally, I think, undermines our local democracy. The current system of local finance is broken, and that's something that most of us agree on. And as a result, we're seeing local authorities resort to desperate measures. In Fife, I've been campaigning alongside local parents against a possible cut in the school week. And thankfully, this campaign has been a success and the proposal has been withdrawn. But what parents can't understand is why our local councils have been put in a position of having to look at cutting the hours our children are taught in school, yet also they're pressing ahead with rolling out national priorities like free school meals and seen the Scottish Government itself underspending on education in areas that councils are having to cut. And to the parents that I've spoken to, this simply doesn't make sense. Yet, thanks to the, the funding crisis local government faces, this is the reality right across Scotland. Alec Rowley highlighted a similar, similar example in respect of teaching numbers. No, um, which again puts pressure on local authorities to deliver centralised commitments. And as always, it's the poor in our communities right across Scotland who are paying the price, with local authorities forced to resort to charges as the only way of bringing in extra revenue or cutting services, which are often a lifeline to local people. So Scottish Labour supports the council tax freeze, but we all know this can only be a short-term measure. At a time when individuals and families are facing a cost-of-living crisis, the freeze is a, well, a welcome boost to family budgets. But we can't get away from the fact that this is a freeze that's underfunded and that it dilutes the power of local councils to deliver frontline public services. Councils who are already faced with... Okay. Pay to go ahead Clear to our constituents as, as a Fife councillor and suggest to them that just to stand still, they were going to have to have an increase of at least 3.4 per cent. And in order to generate any money from the, the, from the council tax to actually be facing 8 per cent, 9 per cent increases, which were the norm of what was happening before the council tax fees came in. Um, you can what have I would be happy time. with if, is if the SNP would be honest with people about the council tax freeze and the impact that is having on our public services. I think it's unfair that that freeze um, is that local authorities are bearing the brunt of austerity from Westminster and here in Holyrood. At a time when 83 per cent of our local authority bu budgets are controlled by the Scottish Government, councils are in an impossible situation. But despite this, councils like Fife are achieving great things, investing money to renew and regenerate our town centre in Dunfermline, investing in early years and in early intervention to end the cycle of disadvantage, creating new and much needed apprenticeships for our young people, building new and much needed council houses to provide affordable housing for local families, policies which are transforming our communities and transforming people's lives. Imagine what Fife and other local authorities could do and deliver if they were properly resourced. So the link between taxation, representation and spending is vital to effective democ democracy. And at the moment, I think that link is broken. So it's time for change. Change is long overdue and I'm pleased that we are now seeing action. In common with other members across the Chamber, I strongly welcome the Commission on Local Tax Reform and I look forward to hearing its findings when it reports in the autumn. I am not sure if it is in the Commission's remit or not, but I hope too that, as well as council tax, business rates will also be considered, because devolving business rates to local councils would help restore the link between local economic development and higher revenues, giving local authorities much more freedom to use these in ways that support the local economy, especially given um, our high streets a boost. I agree too that the Commission should be looking at the overall local government settlement to give councils a fairer deal. There is no doubt that a lot of work needs to be done to find a solution that delivers a fairer deal for local authorities and a fairer deal for local taxpayers. A solution that secures the future of local services 
and our community, that our communities rely on. And whatever the outcome, we need a system that delivers a long-term solution to funding local government services so that local finance is no longer a political football. A system that establishes a clear divide between the roles of central and local government and determinant local budgets. That is fair and is progressive and ensures our public services are sustainable now and in the future. So whether that solution is a fairer council tax reform to make it more progressive or whether it is a different solution altogether, this is a welcome debate and I hope it's one that folk will engage in across Scotland. I congratulate the Local Government Committee on making the recommendation for a commission and I look forward to its findings. Securing cross-party consensus on reform is really important. So, Tories aside, I hope, I hope we can work across the Chamber to make this happen. Many thanks. And our final open debate speaker before I turn to closing speeches is Willie Coffey. Thanks, Presiding Officer. As some of my colleagues have said, the SNP in our 2011 manifesto committed us uh, to consult during this Parliament on a system to replace the council tax, to have a system principally based on fairness and the ability to pay. The Commission set up to take this work on, I'm sure, has all of our best wishes and will carry the hopes of the vast majority of our people that a fairer system of local taxation will emerge from the process. From the era of the Tory poll tax, where millionaires paid the same amount as ordinary families struggling to make ends meet, to the unfair council tax based on property values and not on a person's ability to pay, Scotland has basically had a system of local government taxation for over 25 years or so that the majority of people fundamentally didn't agree with and currently no longer support. This, I think, gives the Commission a good starting point, I think, and I hope that all members who serve on it will relish the task. It looks nicely balanced as a good mixture of national and local government representation, as well as some experienced people from Civic Scotland. So I wish colleagues well, two of whom are part of the Chamber debate today, Minister Biazzi from the SNP Scottish Government and Mr Rowley from Labour. It's quite a remit when you examine it, though, when you take a close look, to identify more than one possible system. To, it must be fair, it must support the delivery of local services, has to take into account income inequalities, the housing market, revenue raising capacity of all the options, administration costs, timetables for implementation, and, of course, transition to whatever new system may emerge. In doing this important work, the Commission will also engage with Scotland's communities and include an assessment of what they think of the emerging proposals. I can already see some useful stress tests that might apply to this process, but the Commission will no doubt come up with their own. In my view, fairness and the ability to pay must be at the heart of any new system. Nobody actually likes paying tax, and some people these days seem to dislike paying their taxes so much that they might do anything to try and avoid it altogether. But more important than the details of any new thresholds or bandings or rebate elements that might be part of any new system, for local tax reform, I think the public will expect that it will be generally fair and hopefully simple enough to understand. The big message, I think, for, for me for the past eight years has been the SNP government's freeze on the council tax. That freeze has meant that the average band D tax player, uh, payer will save over £1,600 by 2016. That's a substantial saving for households, especially during these economic times. And our councils will get an additional £70 million this year to implement that freeze. One of the consequential effects of a freeze is that actually the lowest income households in Scotland get the greatest benefit, since the saving offered by the freeze represents a bigger percentage of their net earnings compared to those on higher earnings. The overall council tax bill, I think, was getting out of hand. And in my authority, the previous Labour administration had increased it by 61 per cent in 10 years. The public was concerned about escalations like that, and I shudder to think what the level it would be now if that sort of hike had been allowed to carry on. The Scottish Government has, in fact, protected local government funding compared to the drastic real terms cuts seen in England, mentioned by my colleague Stuart Macmillan. Now, more recently, as a result of UK government policy, the SNP has had to introduce other mitigations which help protect the poorest and most vulnerable in our communities. Stuart McMillan also mentioned the United Kingdom Government's abolition of council tax benefit, with the Scottish Government putting £69 million towards alleviating that. We also protect low-income families from the bedroom tax, a tax arguably just as bad as the poll tax. Some £90 million has been committed to fully mitigate the bedroom tax, and from April to December last year, 
Over 100,000 awards were made under the discretionary housing payment scheme. This is real help from the SNP government for the poorest in our society. We shouldn't, though, be in a continuing position where a Scottish government has to nullify these negative measures being meted out by the UK. Who knows what they might do next? One thing we do know for sure is that Labour has supported the Tories to agree to another £30 billion worth of austerity cuts. So it's one thing for Labour members to come here and argue for more money when they agree, their MPs have agreed with further cuts in the, the House of Parliament yeah. down in London. So if either of those parties are left to their own devices, people in Scotland will be facing even more hardship. President officer, this work... I'm just winding up, sorry. President officer, this work to come up with some real proposals for change in how we apply local taxation comes at a time when the Scottish Government is offering further progress in engaging with and empowering our councils and communities. Ring fencing has actually dropped from nearly £3 billion worth to around £200 million, meaning local councils now determine many of their own priorities. And with the new empowerment bill, we'll go further, allowing councils to offer local business rates relief, for example, to fine-tune help for local businesses throughout Scotland. Communities, too, will be able to drive change themselves to shape and deliver these local services that this new local tax will support. In that regard, President Officer, I think the new Commission's work can be pivotal in helping to bind all of this together. And once again, I wish all of my colleagues the best of luck in doing this very important work for the people of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. And we now turn to the closing speeches. And I call on Gavin Brown. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Brown. Well, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think there have been some very interesting elements to this debate. And a number of speakers, I have to say, from every party, touched on wider issues that I think we ought to debate in the future, although they weren't strictly within the remit of the debate today. I think talking about the relationship, I think, as Mr Biaggi did, uh, between central and local government is key something that all of us need to reflect upon. And it just reminds me of a quote that uh, former uh, Labour MSP Charlie Gordon once said in this chamber, which I have to, has stuck with me for a long time, where he asked the question, do we want local government or do we want local administration? And I think that's a question we should all ask in the lead up to next year and indeed 2017. We heard about government finance needing to be looked at more widely. We heard, I think largely from Cara Hilton, about the devolution downwards uh, from this place to local authorities being something that needs to be looked at. I do think over the last couple of years, powers have shifted, I think, from local authorities and from health boards and from colleges to this place. And I think there are strong arguments for devolving them downwards. And actually, there are strong arguments, too, for devolving some powers downwards from local authorities to smaller entities such as community councils. Some of our local authorities are particularly large and geographically widespread. And there is an argument, I think, for pushing powers down to local communities where that could be done reasonably well. Um, so good elements. But Deputy Presenter, let's focus, I guess, on the meat of the issue. We heard a lot of speeches, uh, mainly from the SNP, about how awful uh, the council tax is. This is despite uh, John Swinney's uh, resolute rearguard defence of the council tax in this very chamber just a few weeks ago when he made it sound like one of the best taxes ever put forward. But the thing is about the speeches I heard today, I heard all of those speeches from the SNP in 2007. I heard all of those speeches from the SNP in 2008. I heard all of those speeches from the SNP in 2009 And then they went quiet on the issue of local government taxation. They, despite having a pledge, I know Mr Biaggi wasn't an MSP at that time, so he may not realise that the world did not begin in 2011. He may not realise that there was a commitment before that, but they had seven key commitments in 2007, presiding officer, seven key commitments. The SNP in 2007 will scrap the council tax and introduce a fairer system based on ability to pay. Families and individuals on low and middle incomes will on average be between £260 and £350 a year better off. Nine out of ten pensioners will pay less local tax. Now, given this was in 2007, can the minister tell us what happened? 
Will the member, I would be delighted. Will the member take just one moment in his speech to recognise that the reason that didn't take place was in no small part because his party voted against it? Gavin Brown. Presenting officer, I appreciate he wasn't a member at the time, but we were, we were 15 strong now. We were 18 strong then, but still, even with 18 MSPs, we didn't manage to outvote the SNP, Deputy Presiding Officer. Had there been the political will of the administration at the time, with the support of the Liberal Democrats and the Greens and indeed the late Margaret MacDonald, I don't actually have any doubt that they could have got that through. Because when we did debate the local income tax, there was just... There was just a majority, I have to say, in favour of it in this chamber. So it was a lack of political will as opposed to a lack of numbers within this chamber. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, I would like to apologise to Willie Rennie for describing him as left wing. Earlier on in the debate, I am advised by him that he is centre left and not left wing. And I'd like to apologise to Kevin Stewart as well for describing him as left wing because listening to what he had to say, he is actually a low tax MSP. Kevin Stewart is a tax cutter. He is not left wing in any way, shape or form. And let's hear it straight from him. Kevin Stewart. I, I don't have a problem with being called left wing, uh, and I'm not necessarily a t tax cutter. But what I do believe is when you have an unfair tax, you've got to tackle that. That's what the council tax was, and that's why we have the freeze. I believe in progressive taxation, which is something that Mr Brown certainly doesn't. Gavin Brown. Kevin Stewart is the rarest of creatures, Deputy Presiding Officer. He might be the only one I know, but he is a left wing tax cutter. My goodness, what a debate we have had today. Uh, but, Presiding Officer, I think Willie Rennie actually hit the nail on the head, probably without meaning to, but when he described that actually the real reason for this commission being set up was to get the SNP off the hook. They've got a bit of a political problem with local government finance, and they want political cover. Uh, for their uh, local income tax deputy presiding officer. Mr Rennie uh, was quite right to say that. I actually do this, wish the Commission well, and I hope it does uh, shed some light on issues, but I have to say, given what I've heard today, my hopes are not that high. We've got a Labour Party who basically are convinced there will be no recommendations from this committee or Commission at the end of it all. We've got a Liberal Democrat party who believe there really ought to be some recommendations at the end of it all. And we've got an SNP who want a menu of options for all of us to choose from at the end of this commission. But even amongst parties, there appear to be differing views. Deputy Presiding Officer Roderick Campbell talked strongly about trying to end the single person discount because it's very unfair, according to him, that single people currently get a discount. Chick Brodie, uh, but argued strongly for a local income tax where the local authorities can set the rate of local income tax. That, Deputy Presiding Officer, is Liberal Democrat policy. Now, I know that the member used to be a Liberal Democrat. What I didn't realise was that he still was, in many ways, a Liberal Democrat. And then we had Carrot Hilton uh, arguing that business rates ought to be part of this as well. Um, I'd be interested what the Minister says to that. I'm pretty sure from reading uh, the outline that they will not be considered, but perhaps the Minister uh, can address that um, in his closing. So, Deputy President, we've outlined, I think, very clearly why we're not part of the Commission. We've outlined very clear, clearly what we're going to do. And we've had, I guess, a range of responses uh, to our position. Chick Brodie described it, I think, as shameful, which is probably a little bit strong. Uh, Roderick Campbell was disappointed. Uh, Claire Adamson said we won't be missed. Um, but I was heartened by Kevin Stewart's response because Kevin Stewart's position is that he's rather worried that the Scottish Conservatives will miss out by not being part of this commission. So I'm heartened, I'm heartened by Mr Stewart's response to that. Deputy Presiding Officer, I do wish the commission well, um, but I've outlined, I think, very clearly why we won't be part of it, why we're pursuing matters with our commission, and uh, I'll close there. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Alec Rowley. Eight minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, if I can pick up from where Mr Brown left off, I did say um, in introducing this debate for Labour that in 2007 the SNP government had a commitment at that point to a local income tax. And by 2011, for whatever reason, whether it was the unpopularity of the local income tax or the fact that it would be very difficult to work, 
that, 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 that has not happened. Uh, but Mr Brown rightly points out that during that period 2007 to 2011 there was this unofficial coalition between the Tories and the SNP and perhaps had there been a will, had there been a will then the Tory SNP coalition could have actually um, brought, that, brought that about. And he may, he may, he may also, he, he may also, he may also be right that, that the, the SNP government won't let off the hook um, in terms of the council tax freeze policy because where is it going to go and the damage that's being done to local authority services. But the fact is that local government is so important and, and so many speakers speaking here today have emphasised the importance of local government. Um, it is so important that that's why, from our point of view, regardless of the, the, the reasons that the government um, have decided to go along with the local government committee, regardless of those reasons, local government is so important that certainly the Labour Party in Scotland is going to work as part of this commission so that we can look at what the options are that are available, look at where consensus can be achieved and look at where there is a wider consensus out there in communities because the one thing that's absolutely clear is that we need to get a long-term sustainable financial programme in place for local government. It's far too important not to do so. And that's why it is so disappointing that, that, that the Conservative Party have, have not signed up to that. Gavin Brown says one of the reasons is that because of all these, these left-wing left -wing parties that are there. But I thought Willie Rennie uh, addressed that fairly um, and to the point where we're not talking about the levels of taxation that have to be charged. We're simply looking at the options that are available for the systems of taxation that are actually out there. And, you know, it would be wrong at this stage, I think, for any party to say we're going to sign up to whatever the outcome is. That's not how, how it would work. But hopefully what we get is a, a well-informed um, report coming forward that sets out a number of options that sets out the opinions, the views, the flaws, because there is no system, perfect system of taxation. I think, um, I think it, was, it was Willie Coffey, it was Willie Coffey that said that, 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 that no one actually likes to pay tax at the end of the day, but people will pay tax if there are certain principles that are achieved, and that's around a fairness and ability to pay. And that's something certainly that the Conservatives um, have, 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 have got a track record of not delivering in the past. No, I'm sorry, I want to make progress. I'll see how far, far I get. So I want to highlight, pick up on some other issues that was made. Claire Adamson um, made a number of valuable points about the impact of attacks on the ability to pay the most vulnerable in our society and how that, that, that actually impacts on, 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 on people. Um, and also the importance of having a proper system of local taxation that can actually address policies at the local level. Because I do believe believe sincerely that if we're going to tackle inequality and poverty in Scotland, then actually local government is absolutely key to that more so necessarily than, than central government. Central government can provide the strategy, can provide the finances, but it's local government. If you look around Scotland at the 32 local authorities, the front line of tackling inequality and poverty day in and day out has been achieved by local government. But Ms Adams then, Adamson then goes on to make the, the point about no council was stopped from raising the council tax. Well, you're right, but there was a penalty of X amount of millions of pounds in Fife's case, it was £4 million. Fife, in their consultation, and, and I said this at the, the first meeting of the Commission, Fife, in their consultation, asked two questions. Um, as part of the budget consultation on council tax, they asked, would you be prepared to pay additional council tax, ring fence to education, I think, would you be prepared to pay additional council tax, one, if the penalty was there, which in their case was about £4 million, and two, if the penalty was not there? Uh, and, and the answer came back, absolutely Absolutely not in terms of having to incur the penalty in the four million before you even started. But if the penalty was removed, the answer came back that there was a majority saying that they would be prepared to pay more money. Now, I should be clear that Scottish Labour's position is that we would not increase the council tax right now because we believe, as I say, that, that, that the 
there. We have had this crisis in terms of the cost of living crisis, mainly brought on by Mr Brown's party, I have to say. Um, and, and we have had people, 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 no, I'm sorry, I've not got the time. People, we have had people um, on, 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 in effect, a, a wage freeze um, and in many cases a, a wage cut over the last five years. So it would not be the right time to start then introducing taxes for hard-pressed families at this time. But we do have to find a way forward. And there is an indication coming from public consultations that have taken place in local authority areas across Scotland that people do recognise that, that local services need to be paid for. And that's why, and the Minister may want to touch on it in summing up, but that's why I really believe that one of the roles that this Commission has to do is to engage with Civic Scotland, engage with communities across Scotland so that we can get a wider discussion and a wider debate around the types of services that we want to see. Kevin Stewart, in terms, in terms, in terms, yeah, okay. Gavin Price. I'm grateful to him, Gavin. Going back to an earlier point he made, though, the Commission is barely four days old, and he suggested that the Labour Party might not sign up to any proposals it comes up with. Is, is that the position of the Labour Party four days into that Commission? Alec Riley. What I'm saying is the Labour Party will bring forward for its 26th manifesto um, a vision of local government and how we see local government moving forward. Local taxation in terms of council tax is something like 16-17% of the way that local government is financed. We would want, I think, to see a much bigger vision for how local government actually delivers for the people of Scotland. So I wouldn't expect any party to today say they're going to sign up to the outcomes of a commission that's going to report in August. What we will have is a lot more information, and this commission can work to inform all the parties. It's just a pity that your own party didn't get involved in that. But that's perhaps, that's perhaps more to do with your lack of commitment to a local state and the, the, the acknowledgement that the state actually has a role to play in government. Kevin Stewart, Kevin Stewart made the point again about engaging with Civic Scotland and the importance of engaging with Civic Scotland. And I absolutely agree with that. Kevin and his committee have done an excellent job in getting round Scotland, talking to people and listening to people about local government, and hopefully the Commission will, will also pick that up. And McTaggart made the point about poverty and inequality. Um, and there is, an, there is an example in terms of Glasgow, the authority that Anne McTaggart was a member of. The city deal that has been struck with the seven or eight authorities around the Clyde and in Glasgow is going to bring about major change and major investment into the wider Glasgow area. And that has been achieved um, by, by the, the, the local authorities working with the Scottish Government and working with Westminster. And therefore, there are many other um, routes to finance than just simply the, the narrow council tax that has been looked at in this sense. And that is where, if we are looking at a vision of the future, then we have got to look at how we move forward. Presiding officer, I realise it's time to, to wind up. I very much welcome the fact that we have this commission and the Labour Party in Scotland will certainly work with the other parties. It's just a pity that the Conservatives um, are not going to join us. Many thanks. And I now call on Marco Biaggi to wind up the debate. Minister, you have until 5pm. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I, at the start, want to say... The Commission is here to really achieve a greater clarity. That's the, the fundamental mission of it. And if this debate has achieved anything, I'm glad that I'm now in my mind quite clear on the Labour Party's position on the council tax freeze, which I've heard repeatedly from uh, Alex Rowley that they are in support, perhaps as part of the, the new leadership of the Labour Party, but I'm glad to have that clarity. We will be able to factor it in, as uh, all members will, to ongoing debates about the funding of local government and the council tax freeze. Because after all, the council tax freeze, which Labour claim they invented, much as Cara Hilton might uh, dispute that now has been both fair and funded. It helps those at the bottom uh, twice as much as a proportion of their income as those at the top. And no wonder council tax is a regressive tax. It hits the poorest hardest. Putting it up hits the poorest hardest. Not putting it up helps the poorest the most. It's fairly simple. And as a wider issue of local government funding, which this debate has touched on, I would just say that 
broadly, there are three big chunks to what the Scottish Government spends money on. There's health, which I think everybody in here has agreed we have to protect. Then there's local government, and then there's everything else. And between 2013 and 2016, that local government chunk is seeing a 2.6% increase in cash terms. Everything else is just seeing a 1.0% increase in cash terms. So yes, let's accept that local government is under pressure. I wouldn't ideally want to be in a situation where I was getting a 2.6% cash increase or a 1.0% increase in cash. But we're all under pressure here, and there are departments in this government coming under far more pressure than the local government finance team. If you need an example of what uh, austerity economics can mean for local government, you just need to look at England, where local authorities there are facing, in the current spending round, a real terms cut of about three times that of local government in Scotland. And that's just today. There's tomorrow. If we're looking ahead for local government funding into the spending round in 2020, there are massive implications from the Conservative Party's spending plans. The First Minister has set out an approach where UK public spending should rise in real terms by 0.5% per year. And according to OBR analysis, that would still result in the debt to GDP ratio, but for local uh, declining. But for local government, you would have massive uh, benefits because if for no other reason than that £59 billion gap between the, the First Minister and the Scottish Government's ideal situation at UK level and what the Conservatives plan to do would mean between four and a half, five billion perhaps in, in Barnet consequentials, which would have a huge impact on the funding available to local government. 4.5 to, to 5 billion. We're talking about a funding gap that is broadly equivalent to every penny we spend on nursery, primary and secondary schooling in this country. And the consequences for local government would be severe. You know, those are plans that would see us live out a decade of austerity and return to public spending terms, not, uh, levels not seen since the 1930s. So if we want to protect the core funding that goes to local government, as well as the taxes they have to raise themselves to, to make up the rest. We have to work together as much as we can in this chamber to resist that austerity and protect the needy and vulnerable that do depend on the vital services provided by councils. And for that, we all agree here on the need to uh, find more revenue. But I would hope that none of us would want to raise it from those least able to pay. There is a difference incidentally, uh, Gavin Brown should be aware of, between a tax that takes into account ability to pay, which council tax to an extent does, and one based on an ability to pay, and his beloved poll tax from uh, previous debates past that took no account whatsoever. In Westminster in 2010, Labour and the SNP went through the lobbies together to oppose George Osborne's VAT rise because we agreed that although it would create more money for vital services and that more money was broadly needed, it would hit the poorest hardest and it was the wrong way to do it. That is the principle we have here. And you know, if Gap... Yes, Alex fair Johnson. enough. Will the Minister acknowledge that the current system, the poorest are not hit hardest because they are supported through the benefit system to pay their council tax and that that is 90% funded through the block grant from Westminster? Minister. The poorest were certainly uh, not helped very much by the 10% cut to that scheme that was introduced by the UK government. The Scottish government had to step in. And let's remember as well that people who are just above the level that is required to qualify for council tax benefit suffer very severe increases. I, I used to think that the Conservative Party supported the, the person in the middle, the person of modest income, the person on the low but fixed income like a pensioner. Those are exactly the kind of people that have had difficulties with the council tax system. And Gavin Brown before was remarking on Kevin Stewart apparently being a, a left-wing tax cutter. I will leave that for the discussion afterwards. But it's not about cutting or, or raising tax. When that VAT vote went through, that would have made every Conservative in the House of Commons a right-wing tax increaser. The measure of the principle isn't in whether tax is going up or down, but who it's going up or down for. And in looking ahead, at looking at how we fund local government, this Commission has to set out that kind of cost-benefit analysis. It assesses the options and provides the next Scottish Government, whoever 
that will be a platform on which to base local tax reform. You know, I described it as a menu beforehand. I mean, yes. I make tag out. Thank the Minister for allowing the intervention. But when he talks about the Commission, the, the, one of the local government's um, recommendations, it was about looking at, examining other ways that local government can raise funds and not just about the council tax. Will that be on the menu for the Commission? Minister. The Commission, as has been identified by Willie Coffey, has quite a, an ambitious remit already and a tight timescale. The Commission is focusing on replacements for council tax. But the broader debate is one that is in process. I've had meetings with COSLA over the issue of uh, wider local government finance, and that debate will continue to happen. But the, to go back to the menu analogy, if this commission produces a menu at the end and Labour decide to order the meat and potatoes of council tax, you know, stodgy but a little bit familiar, that's them well informed. Perhaps the, the Greens will look at land value tax, the open-topped Scandinavian sandwich that everybody looks at but not very many people order. And perhaps everybody, uh, other people will look at some kind of fusion cuisine. But what we will have is a sweet of informed options. As the remit says, the Commission will identify and examine alternatives. And we have to do that. We have to, because it would be a brave person that predicted the Commission could unite around one option. But we can unite around an assessment, we can unite around a suite, and we can therefore lay the groundwork for quite relatively rapid, that was a suite of options with a U-I-T-E, I hasten to add. I'm sure there'll be something for dessert, but that's a, a debate for another day. But that debate, that process of change that happens probably quite quickly after the 2016 election, because let's face it, we can't continue a council tax freeze for 40 years. We have to have a long-term solution has to carry legitimacy. It has to carry legitimacy from those of us around this chamber. It has to carry legitimacy from the public. So the Commission is going to lead a participative process. It was one of the biggest topics in the first meeting, and we aim to finalise, launch a written consultation very, very soon. But we also want to go out there face-to-face -face around the country to understand what the public wants and expects. Because we've had these commissions before. You know, there have been commissions of the great and the good that have examined things behind closed doors. There have been local authority commissions that have looked at it but not really had the power to implement their changes. You've had academic, professional, single party examples. This is one that brings the people together who could be in a position as the next government to actually implement change. It has a political buy-in widely around this chamber that makes it uniquely capable of being effective. And I say it has political buy-in around the, the chamber, and I'm, I'm very sorry to say that Gavin Brown hasn't just abstained from membership, he actually asked a question, what is the point? I have to say, very often when Gavin Brown talks, I, I sometimes wonder that myself. But the point of this commission is to go through this, to engage. And the Conservative Party Commission that has been suggested, I simply would ask Gavin Brown, is it going to, with its remit to examine all kinds of taxes, going to be, and no one from civil society, um, social justice background on it, is it going to be able to examine things in enough detail? Is it going to be able to provide the detail for the carers that Kevin Stewart mentioned? Is it going to be able to provide the detail on how regional mechanisms will work, as Claire Adamson uh, highlighted? And will close. it provide clarity for everyone. I think this Commission will. I ask for everybody to support it here and sadly if the Tories aren't going to it's just one more example of Scotland going one way and them going another. That concludes the debate on the Commission on Local Tax Reform. We now move to decision time. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that amendment one, number 12423.1 in the name of Alex Rowley which seeks to amend motion number 12423 in the name of Marco Biaggi on the Commission on Local Tax Reform be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members to cast the votes now.
The result of the vote on amendment number 1242.3.1 in the name of Alex Riley is as follows. Yes, 88. No, 13. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12423 in the name of Marco Biaggi as amended on the Commission on Local Tax Reform be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12423 in the name of Mark Biaggi as amended is as follows. Yes, 88. No, 13. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time.